All right. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to our training session. It's um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to hearing what um, different people in our audience are busy with in the green space, and also just to understanding. Um, what people do and don't know and understand um, in terms of also of the opportunities. So welcome to this training session. Um, it is a training workshop that National Business Initiative um, is enabling um, and supporting and to create environmental awareness on um, sustainability and green practices um, in our in businesses. Um, so we've got a very specific target audience today and part of what we'll go through is the um, broad implications as well as the very specific implications for of climate change um, and the growing trend towards um, green greening and green industrialization and what that means for your businesses. So we're excited to be with you today um, and I just want to welcome everybody. I'm Belinda Petrie. I'm from a company called One World Sustainable In Investments. Um, we've been contracted by the NBI, the National Business Initiative, to run this training with you, um, all of you today. And yeah, as I said earlier, we're definitely looking forward to it. I see that people are coming still into the room. Um, while we are still waiting for people, please, colleagues, and I'll repeat this a bit later for the new people, I'd love to know who's with us today. So if you could please, in the chat room, just post your name and the name of your organization. And if you can just put in brackets um, what, your, what your company does, what your enterprise does, so that we've got a, a good sense um, of who's in the room with us um, today. The, um, I'll go through the agenda and then I'm just going to see if there are any welcoming remarks. So what we'll be going through with you today is um, four modules of training. So it's quite a, a packed morning and I'm sure many of you are going through what we're busy going through at the moment, which is the inevitable load shedding, very topical and a green industrialization. Um, so colleagues, what we'll do today is go through module one, um, which is climate risk screening and trying to get some insights with you as to what the key risks are for businesses. Um, and with that, you know, we'll also be starting by trying to understand what you what your level of knowledge and understanding is of the climate change in the green space. Um, and Cyril will take 10 minutes to take us through a Mentimeter exercise. Um, and we'll give some feedback from that. Um, and then I'm going to give a very high level presentation um, on climate change and sustainability. And we'll pause then to do a question and answer session. Um, where you know, I think we'll just cement um, our knowledge of the overall drivers um, for why are we here today, why are we in the room, um, and then we'll start drilling down into into some of the um, realities for you, um, and bringing all of this home um, for businesses in in South Africa. Um, so the second module is on climate action. What are the opportunities for businesses and entrepreneurs? Um, because you know, climate change. Obviously, it's something that is a massive risk factor, um, and the language has moved towards climate crisis um, and more and more away from climate change. Um, but there are also opportunities that are associated um, for businesses and entrepreneurs. So we'll spend some time on that, and Cyril will take us through that and really start bringing it home to the um, types of businesses that we have in the room, construction, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, the, and this will also be an opportunity for some interaction. Um, so we'll be doing going into breakaway groups um, and having a look in those breakaway groups at what are the impacts and the solutions um, for businesses. Um, and then we'll take a break um, for half an hour just to ease everyone's intensity of the um, training this morning and then move into applying a toolkit um, that One World developed a couple of years ago for the African Development Bank, um, and it was a toolkit. It is a toolkit that's specifically targeted at um, small, medium enterprises, and it's a tool that allows you to screen your business for potential climate risk as well as for opportunities. Um, 
And we'll end today with module four, which is really focusing on opportunities. So um, how could you move forward in terms of implementing sustainable solutions? Um, and we'll have a discussion before we end on enhancing sustainability in your businesses. So colleagues, that's what um, your morning looks like. Um, I would like to um, again welcome you from the One World side and just hand over to our NBI colleagues um, for some welcoming remarks, please. Thank you, Belinda. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you beautifully. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Abigail Kuluse, and I am the program manager for economic inclusion, uh, township economies. And I'm very glad to be having this session this morning. And thanks to One World for putting it together. And thanks to all the participants for being here. I do hope um, more will, will join us. It is quite tricky with all the load shedding as well. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that those who can join us will join us. And uh, yeah, I look forward to a very fruitful session. And I believe that each and everyone in the business will walk away with some um, real takeouts for their business uh, in terms of how they move forward and progress in the green economy space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abigail, um, and also very pleased that NBI has been able to enable this training um, for everyone that's with us today. And colleagues, please don't forget, I can see there are some introductions coming in the chat. That's fantastic. Um, and welcome to all of you, but please don't forget to put your name, your organization name, and then what your company does in brackets in the chat room. So I see so far, there's not a lot in the chat. Um, there are more people on the call than there are in the chat. So please don't forget to introduce yourselves. Um, but I do see we have um, plumbing and construction represented, um, as well as obviously NBI and, and the One World team. So if you can please just continue to post in the chat room, that would be great. And colleagues, you may also, of course, use the chat room um, for any comments or questions that you have, bearing in mind that we do have um, a Q&A session and some interactive sessions through the morning. Um, so you will have the opportunity to, to talk. Um, but if there's something that's on your mind and you want to get it down, please do um, use the chat room for that. We will be monitoring that as we go along. Um, all right, so with that, as I said earlier, we, we do want to try and understand um, what you know and think about the climate change and green, green issues, um, and we'll be going through a Mentimeter exercise now to do that, and I'll hand over to Cyril to manage that. Cyril, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Belinda. Um, I just wanted to check. Uh, so typically with these Mentimeter uh, exercises, if we have, you know, lots of colleagues in the room, 30, 40 odd, then these Mentimeter exercises works very well. Um, but I see we have a, a smallish crowd this morning. So I think maybe what, what would be nice if we actually give an opportunity to, to each of our participants. Um, so I'll just... Uh, call out a, a number of our participants quickly uh, and then ask them just to to share with us so rather than going through the Mentimeter exercises what their understanding is of of environmental sustainability sustainability in their company uh, and maybe a bit just about their company as well uh, if if that's okay um, so maybe let me uh, just go down the list here uh, I see our one of our colleagues is Chimani Mabete. Uh, maybe if I can call on you just to uh, share a bit from, from your side what your understanding of uh, sustainability is and maybe just a little bit about your company. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, how are you? I'm fine and you. Good. Please right, go ahead. No, but yeah, my company is uh, just a plumbing company that does general buildings and civil works. Uh, basically, for me and my company, uh, using sustainable uh, green um, energies, trying to tell the client, um, trying to save the client money in any way possible, and trying to use material that is good for the environment. 
that's just our as a company that's just how we we, we approach sustainability and green technologies nice thank you yeah i mean i think that's that's exactly what what we'll be talking about this morning so glad you can join us and uh, we'll really dig into some of those issues a bit more this morning um maybe then i can ask uh, another colleague uh miss duduzile maroncela uh, if you can just share with us a little bit about your company and your understanding about sustainability uh, good morning everyone can, can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear you. Hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Tutuzile Matonzela from Didi's Toilet Business Enterprise. We are doing a maintenance renovation and we are also uh, doing plumbing and electricity. So uh, in our company, the way of uh, sustainability, we are using a a best material SAPS approved so that whatever that we are servicing for the company, it must not be a problem again. So we are trying to do a better service and a quality one. Yeah, yes, so that even if whatever the damage is gonna be happened, but maybe after some time. So that's the main thing that we, we are trying to do. We are not focused, yes, as a business people, we want money, but at the same time, it's the part of marketing ourselves if we are doing a, a, a good service for the customers because it's good for the customer to, to, to tell other people about the service that you did for them. So uh, to, 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 pro, to protect the, the, the company, and yes, the, yes, that's why we make sure that whatever that we are doing, we don't get complaints from the customer. Yes. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks to Zile. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think marketing is, is definitely one of the things we'll be talking about this morning as well. Um, so keen to, to explore that with you and, and other colleagues on the line as well. Um, going further down, uh, the the line we have uh, Ms. Mpo Nangu. Uh, maybe you can just share with us a bit about your company and your you know your thoughts on on sustainability. Uh, Ms. Mpo, please. Um. Okay, I think Ms. Mpo Nangu, we can't hear at the moment. Uh, um, morning. Oh, yes. Mon uh, morning, how are you? I'm good and you? Good, thanks. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Mpo Nangu from Nangu Investment. We are trading as Nangu Facilities Management. We are in construction and electrical plumbing, and we've just um, registered ourselves to do uh, to become solar uh, installers so we're just doing a training and test with um some other company that we, we registered with yeah so we're looking forward to to train because we we are challenged as smme and we we like would like to be sustainable in the working and the business environment because currently we are not that's the honest truth so yeah we look i'm looking forward to learn and understand and, and learn more and yeah to grow in this industry um yeah and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and participate uh brilliant thanks Mpo. and yeah absolutely we're looking forward to to sharing exactly you know on on those items with you uh throughout the course of this morning as well um so glad to glad to have you here uh thank you um maybe let's ask one or two more colleagues uh i see we have on the uh on our participant list as well vusi france uh vusi i wonder if if you can maybe just share a little bit about your company uh and you know what what you're doing in terms of of sustainability morning everyone 
morning, Vusi. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Vusi from Koweni PTY LTD. Uh, in our company, we are dealing with general maintenance, construction, building, and some electrical and plumbing. Uh, I'm looking forward to learn more about this uh, because it will help the world to have a, a good non-environmental environment because they are introducing some new equipment that will help the environment. So I'm willing to, to work, to learn about it and work with it in our company. Uh, nice, thank you, Vusi. And yeah, again, I think that's that's literally exactly what what we're also will be exploring with you later throughout this morning is you know different technologies that's not just good for for your business, for your clients, but also for for the environment as well. Um, so yeah, looking forward to to sharing that with you later this morning, and and thanks for just sharing with us as well, um, colleagues. I think let's let me ask one more colleague to to just share with us uh miss vanessa uh, maybe just share a little bit about your company and your approach to to sustainability in your company as well uh please vanessa Uh, I think you're still, with... yes, please go ahead, Vanessa. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Vanessa Ramodibe. Uh, I'm the director for Ramodibe Construction. And uh, my approach to sustainability in the construction is to use materials that are friendly to the environment and having means to sustain ourselves throughout since we are um, experiencing the log, uh, the log sh load shedding on how well can we use um, natural light, you know, your, your, your solar geysers, your, your, our normal uh, material, but to ensure that the material that we are using, it's sustainable in a way that we can reuse it in a very good way that is not affecting the human lives as well as the environment. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Yes, no, exactly. Uh, Vanessa, I think that's, again, you know, very much part of, of today's conversation. Um, and I think what what we're also excited to share with you is, you know, just beyond uh, solar or, you know, using the sun as as a natural resource. Uh, you know, there's a, a whole host of, of other opportunities as well. Again, you know, that's good for businesses that's good for clients uh, and that's good for the environment so we're looking forward to to sharing uh some of those uh new technologies new new measures uh different ways of thinking uh but yeah i think uh thank you so much vanessa i think with with that uh, i'm gonna hand over to to belinda uh i know there's a couple of colleagues that that we haven't called upon yet uh, but later this morning, we will have uh, some some sessions to discuss and then hoping to to hear from other colleagues as well. Uh, so, yeah, with that, uh, happy to to hand back to you, Belinda. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cyril. And um, and thanks, colleagues, for sharing some interesting insights it's really it's really great to get a sense of where all of you are um in the space at the moment and what you're thinking about um, and also realizing that there's a lot of thinking going on about sustainability um which is great um, so it's a very good place to be starting from i would think cyril um and i was just you know we don't need to answer it now but i was really intrigued by some of your comments um for example um, uh, one of you said that it's very good from a marketing and reputation perspective and that you want to avoid complaints from your customers. Um, and perhaps as we go through the various interactive sessions today, we can learn more about what you're facing. Um, 
And I think it's very helpful to know that people are thinking about um, the importance of the environment. It feels like that point is coming home. Um, and I suppose, you know, my word's not yours, but certainly my take home from that is a, a good level of understanding that we can't continue to use materials in the way that we do going forward. Um, because there won't be anything left if we continue the way we have been. Um, and with that, I very much noted the very honest comment um, was that we're, you know, bluntly put, we're not sustainable at the moment, or I suppose you were talking about your own business, um, but I think that's also an, an important observation. Um, colleagues, I think everything's all right. Um, if you've got issues hearing us, etc., please just let me know. And the reason I'm saying that is the lights keep going on and off. It's like Eskim's trying to put them back on, but it's not quite working. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I'm working from my laptop, so that's not a problem, but I'm just concerned about the Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm sorry. I apologize on Eskim's behalf for what we're going through this morning. All right. So colleagues, we'll go now into, you know, this question of what are the climate risks for businesses? Um, and perhaps before I start, just to say um, the climate change and sustainable development, and a lot of you spoke about sustainability, you spoke about the environment. Um, these issues, sustainable development, um, environmental issues, the social issues that come with that, the governance issues and the climate change issues are very interrelated. Um, so you'll find us using sometimes climate change language and sometimes more ESG, environmental social governance language, um, but they're very tied up together. And um, just to perhaps set the scene in that, from that perspective, in terms of global policy and the global response to the what I was calling earlier the climate crisis, um, has been very much to take an integrated approach. Um, and so, you, if you were to have a look, and maybe some of you have, the Sustainable Development Goals um, that were concluded in, in the last quarter of 2015 um, as per, part of the 2030 um, agenda, Sustainable Development Agenda. There's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, a couple of them are very explicit about climate change, but actually climate change underpins all of them in many ways um, because not taking um, Climate change into account will prevent um, the achievement of most of those sustainable development goals. And we saw that theme of integration going through into the, um, at the end of 2015. So 2015 was a big year um, in terms of the global policy space. So at the end of 2015, um, we saw the Paris Agreement, um, which was the climate change agreement um, that has since been ratified um, and been adopted um, and is now in force and under implementation. The Paris Agreement um, really focused on achieving a limit of a two degree temperature warming um, in the global space and targeted one and a half degrees, but also with a very strong relationship to the sustainable development goals. Um, so that just to set the scene in terms of an integrated approach and just to say to you that you will see different language and hear different language, but in the end amounting to the same thing um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Sorry. So what is climate change? Um, and apologies if I'm telling you things you already know. Um, the climate change is something that's been going on forever. I mean, it's, you know, the climate does change, it goes through cycles, and we're busy going through what's known as a La Nina cycle at the moment, which is combined with El Nino, um, brings periods of droughts and then flooding and then droughts and then flooding. So that's sort of interannual um, variability. But what climate change does, um, the way that we framed it in the, in the global policy environment, is it brings about a change in average weather conditions over a long period of time because of human activities. So human activities mainly driven by the industrialization um, and the industrial revolution. Um, 
those human activities um, are responsible for the term that we now call climate change, which is separate to ice age type language. It's over and above those kinds of um, cyclical periods that we have. Um, so the human activities and why I mentioned the industrial revolution is that it, it really did bring about a, a sharp increase in the burning of fossil fuels um, for which we are now paying the price um, and, and why we are sitting with the situation. And many of you understand that because you're talking about using clean fuels or cheaper fuels. Your drivers are maybe because you're trying to make um, your client service cheaper and also reduce your own costs um, and that's completely understandable because with climate change we've also got very sharply rising electricity prices in the country and this is really just to go back to what I was saying earlier is that the environmental social climate change and governance issues are very interrelated and there are significant social impacts that come with it. Um, and the drivers sometimes sit side by side. So in South Africa, one of the reasons that we are pushing for um, green energy is a because of exactly what we're experiencing at the moment, which is energy insecurity, otherwise known as load shedding in South Africa. Um, also because of climate change reasons, we're trying to reduce the burning of fossil fuels. South Africa relies heavily on coal. Um, which is one of the high polluting fossil fuels um, globally. Um, and because of, of cost, um, electricity prices are becoming unviable um, independently of the climate change drivers. So we, we're sitting with a fairly complex situation, but what it means is there are a lot of really good reasons um, to, to push for what you are all talking about. So colleagues, human activities, um, the burning of fossil fuels that I was talking about now, has drastically increased the amounts of greenhouse gases that are released into the atmosphere. Carbon is, is one of those. There are six greenhouse gases. I'm not going to um, bore you with the technical details, and I don't think it matters if you know what those six greenhouse gases are, or if you don't. Um, to a great extent, but I think what's important to know is that they're all measured in terms of carbon, so everything, um, so methane is one of the highest emitting greenhouse gases, um, much higher than, than, than coal, for example, or carbon, um, but it is measured in terms of carbon equivalent, so carbon emissions are the ones we understand the best, most people know them, um, and so everything gets converted back into a, what we call a CO2, carbon dioxide um, equivalent measure. Um, but there are six of these greenhouse gases that are released into the atmosphere, and the accumulation of those greenhouse gases has resulted in global warming, and with that what we've seen is an increasing and, and scary actually rise in temperatures and we'll go through just now what that what that means. Um, but basically what it means what I've just said is those greenhouse gases get trapped in the Earth's atmosphere, they can't get out and that's what's causing the global warming. Um, and so global warming is probably the most commonly used term to um, when people talk about climate change. So the newspapers, you know, the media, the kind of language that the average person on the street and in business understands is, is global warming. And so it's a very useful phrase because that's exactly what it is. Um, and so the picture on the right shows you what's going on. So you've got say coal-fired power station um, emitting great plumes of smoke into the atmosphere that then gets trapped. What it means is that you get less snow and ice. So one of the biggest impacts of climate change is um, the melting um, of the glaciers. And what that in turn means, in turn means is that that ice has to go somewhere. So as it melts because the atmosphere and the temperatures are getting higher, it melts and it runs off mostly into the sea. And it's partly what causes sea level rise, which has significant impacts for coastal areas. Um, and, and we see this particularly in small island states, for example, who've got very um, tiny amounts of land area um, and, and are struggling to combat. I mean, what do you do when the sea encroaches? What you also see is oceans getting warmer, um, greater um, 
episodes or increased episodes of flooding, stronger storms um, and changing rainfall and, and snowfall patterns. Um, so that's the story that that picture um, on the right is, is showing you. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about that further, um, because this all has, you know, you, you, at this point, people often go, well, so what, um, you know, so what if the temperature just goes up uh, one or two degrees, it doesn't seem like an enormous amount, um, and even three or four degrees doesn't seem like a huge amount, we'll just have to live with being a bit warmer, but it's not, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Um, and there are knock-on effects or cascading effects um, of that global warming. And this is what this slide is talking about. Um, so this slide was this slide was produced by a company called Iberdrola. Um, they're a private sector company that was initially established in Spain. Um, and they work in the, well, they now work across the renewable energy space. But when we first started working with them, probably about 15 years ago, um, they were very focused on solar energy and very interested in the solar energy that Africa has vast amounts of. Um, so, you know, I think they've really, over the years, come to grips with their social and the economic impacts of climate change. Um, so I'll start on the left, um, just because I have to start somewhere, um, but it's not necessarily in order of priority. Um, as I mentioned just now, the coastal areas are highly impacted by sea level rise. And to put it into perspective, colleagues, um, I was in the Seychelles probably now two years ago, and one of the biggest debates they were having at the time was introducing policy um, that what they call a setback policy to stop people from building um, property on the right on the coast. Um, and it was an interesting debate because the reason they were introducing, wanting to introduce the policy was because the sea is already encroaching on the land. So if somebody was owned, say, a, a 500 square meter um, plot of land um, that was reducing to maybe 400 square meters. And so the value of that property owner's land was reducing. Plus there were obviously the dangers of um, coastal flooding, et cetera, of, of homes or, or businesses. The interesting thing for the Seychelles and why it's such a good example is you can't, you can't actually build in the middle of the country. It's a very small island, well, there are lots of islands, but the main one is, is also very small. It's extremely mountainous. Um, so it makes it very difficult um, for human settlements, um, businesses, airports, you know, all of your kind of infrastructure to actually construct um, in, in the place that's least affected by, by sea level rise. Um, so I'm just using it as an example. Many of you are in the construction industry of the kinds of challenges um, that, that coastal areas um, face. Um, sometimes what this means is that whole towns need to be relocated. So that could be re towns in coastal areas. It could be um, settlements or towns that are living, that are in floodplains. Um, we've seen this with the KZN floods, um, which have been horrific. Um, partly because of climate change, but also um, to be very straightforward, and this affects all of you as well, as partly also because of not using materials sustainably, not maintaining infrastructure, um, and basically not fixing things when they are broken, which in itself is not sustainable. But colleagues, to come back to this, you know, if there's a serious threat of sea level rise and there's an entire town right on that coast, Obviously, you know, one of the things to consider is the relocation. Can you imagine what that's like for people and um, a whole community to have to move? I mean, it always takes me back to the District 6 days, which was for different reasons, but an entire area was relocated because of the Group Areas Act um, under apartheid. And the ramifications of moving those people are still going on today. And it was decades ago. Um, you know, there's still land claims, there are land restitution issues, communities got broken up. So there's some very serious social impacts around this. Um, and then colleagues, there are issues around agriculture, so shrinking productivity of, of farming, 
um, and harvest harvests. Um, so reduced um, crop yields, um, and again, you know, this threatens on a bigger picture level food security, and obviously threatens the incomes of farmers. Um, and then there are health issues. If you move down to the bottom right of my slide, um, diseases spreading due to higher temperatures, and we've certainly seen increased burden of disease um, because of climate change. And that's partly because of fossil fuel burning activities. So if any of you have been to Secunda lately um, or in the last 12 years, the air pollution there is, is frightening um, and that's causing health issues. Um, so not dealing with climate change is causing health issues, but at the same time, increased temperatures um, can bring about um, an increased burden of disease. So, for example, malaria areas may be increasing, um, and particularly often because of floods. Mosquitoes like, um, you know, stagnant pools of water. That's where they breed. So after a flood, you always have pools of water lying around, and this can increase the incidence of malaria. One of the issues that South Africa is facing a lot is fresh water supply. Um, issues. So we're having water shedding now as um, is increasing um, and escalating in parts of the country like the Eastern Cape um, because there isn't enough water and also because of the maintenance issues that we saw in KZN. But water security is also under threat. Um, and there's also often talk of um, an analysis that's being done on issues around increased migration or conflict um, because of things like water insecurity um, or food insecurity. So colleagues, all of this together um, brings about um, increases in, in poverty, which obviously for a country like South Africa that's constantly fighting poverty, this is a massive issue. Um, and this is what we're trying to avoid. So I was really excited to hear many of you talking about using the environment more sustainably because that is what's going to reduce the poverty impact um, of climate change. All right, so let's just bring this back to what does this mean for business? Um, from a sort of bigger, again, picture perspective, um, climate change impacts are not limited to geographical impacts, um, which are you know, floods, droughts, um, and increased temperatures but also have consequences for most industries, um, even finance. So, you know, you probably think your bank is, is secure um, and, you know, it probably isn't going to be directly impacted, but the banks are paying significant amounts of attention to climate risks because they worry about what the risks, those risks mean for their lending and investment portfolios, which could include too many of you. Um, there are also impacts for education and obviously some very direct impacts for agriculture. Um, and the, the reality here, colleagues, and why nobody can escape from the climate change issue is because climate change is such a cross-cutting issue um, and impacts on every absolutely everyone. And from a you know, whether you're rich or poor, there's no doubt that if you're rich, you can probably safeguard yourself better, um, but everybody is impacted. And we've seen this, haven't we? I mean, we've seen the impacts of heat stress in places like Canada last year, which is a so-called rich country, um, as much as we've seen the terrible impacts of the floods in KZN in a much poorer country. So it's happening everywhere. And because of that, Global um, gross domestic product, um, which is the way we measure um, wealth and poverty in the world um, economically, so it's an economic measure, um, it, that's projected to drop by 15% from 2010 levels should in temperatures increase by 2.5 degrees Celsius. Um, this was the global body for science, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change report in 2018 said this. And then they confirmed it in the report that was released earlier this year. Um, and what they have also confirmed is that we're not managing to keep to the Paris Agreement goal, which was to limit climate change to two degrees. So what I'm trying to say is that it's extremely likely. Um, if it were just up to me, I would say it's certain that we will not limit to two degrees. And so we will see these kinds of impacts. Colleagues, this is my favorite um, way of looking at climate change. Um, I am a bit biased about it because it's something that I, that I developed, but it's, it's a tool, a model that we've used for 
probably about 14 years now. And it's really a great way of understanding how climate change cascades through a system or has a knock-on effect um, through a system. And it really does address the so what question. So I'm just going to really use this as a way of repackaging some of the information that I've already given you. Um, there's nothing new here, um, but just wanted to show how the knock-on effects of climate change, <clears throat> excuse me, works. So at a first order level, which are your basic climate parameters that none of us, you, me, um, well, one world is trying to do something about it, but we can't on our own stop temperature rise. Um, so these are the things, I, parameters that I usually say are things we can't as individuals do anything about um, other than through an overall contribution. Um, and what it means is that temperature will rise, rainfall will change, and we will have stronger winds and changes in weather. And so therefore we have to respond to that and adapt to that, as well as trying to use materials sustainably so that we limit um, those kinds of impacts. At a second order level, a temperature rise or change in rainfall then has a knock-on effect on the physical environment and the biophysical environment. Um, so temperature rise, for example, can bring about um, a drought um, and water scarcity coupled with rainfall change. So the interaction between temperature rise and rainfall change in this example that I'm talking about can bring about drought, um, which in turn can bring about water scarcity. Um, and the interactions come from lack of rainfall, land degradation, um, and one of the, the most difficult things I think to deal with in a landscape are cycles of floods and droughts. So if you have an episode of flooding like we've seen in KZN and it also spread to parts of Mpumalanga, which is a big agriculture area, um, the land gets, um, it gets changed, you know, it gets impacted by those floods. Um, and then when the drought comes, it's very hard to recover. Um, from the flood, because the drought just hardens everything. And if a flood comes again after the drought, that just washes the soil away. So those cycles um, make it very difficult um, for farmers and, and contribute to land degradation. That then in turn at a third order level brings about impacts for the things that we rely on. The ecosystem services and production potential gets changed. And this is a lot of what you were talking about, you know, using materials sustainably, etc. Um, if your ecosystem services are not functioning and producing properly, you won't have the materials that you need um, to be able to do construction um, and provide the, the services that your businesses provide. And this can come about because of changes in biodiversity, um, and that often can be caused by heat stress. Um, what I talked about earlier in terms of decreased agriculture productivity, um, and one of the biggest realities is, is the impacts of floods, which cause problems for infrastructure like roads and bridges, um, and people can't then get their product to market, they can't get their children to school, they can't get themselves to work, um, and they can't get to a hospital if they need to for that period of time that that road <coughs> or bridge is, is not functioning. And this is a big thing that we saw in KZN, right? And it takes a long time when you've had a big flooding event like we, we did in KZN um, to recover and to rebuild that infrastructure. And in that time that it takes to rebuild the infrastructure, people are functioning at a much lower level of, of um, operational capacity because they haven't got the infrastructure at their disposal to do what they need. What that means for businesses in the construction industry, plumbing, you know, many of your kinds of businesses is to be able to adapt quickly and provide services that can help rebuild um, quicker and better. So when you're rebuilding a road, to not just build it in the same way that it was built before, because obviously it couldn't sustain the flood, but to actually think about um, how to make a road more flood resilient. And this goes for all kinds of, of infrastructure as well. And um, the fourth order impacts colleagues are, are where the rubber really hits the road. I mean, this is where things become difficult for individuals um, because you've got reduced productivity. Um, 
a decline in worker health because of pollution. This is something we've seen in Durban South where the petrochemical industry is, in Secunda that I spoke about earlier, and um, people's health is impacted, they can't function, um, increased conflict, loss of livelihoods and, and jobs. Um, they are, and it's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. Um, so these are some of the um, knock-on effects um, of climate change. So what does it mean for business? Um, we've spoken about this um, most certainly. Um, so one aspect is productivity. Um, this is caused by health issues, decreasing health, as mentioned this just now, um, and that reduced worker productivity in turn can have an impact on the employer. Um, so a man, for example, that's operating under heat stress conditions, um, the health and safety law in this country says that, I think it's 26 degrees, um, is the threshold. So if the temperatures rise above 26 degrees, um, the employee, the employees are, are by law compelled to be working in conditions that don't exceed that 26 degrees because it's considered dangerous. Therefore, the company must either provide air conditioning um, or have a break from people working. Um, and if they are providing air conditioning, let's say it's in a, a deep a deep shaft mine, um, it gets really hot. I mean, if you can imagine the Northern Cape, where a lot of the manganese mining is going on, for example, it gets really, really hot. Um, so the costs of that air conditioning are very high and often actually the air conditioning units break. Um, so that means that the whole mine operation gets shut down for the period of that, that heat event. Um, they can't function and imagine what it would be like for you as an enterprise if your whole business had to shut down because of something like this and the loss of productivity and revenue that you would incur. Plus you would have a bunch of very unhappy clients because they wouldn't be getting your services. So those are some of the key productivity issues. Um, there's, then there's the cost of regulation and insurance. And interestingly, um, since ESCOM is so topical at the moment, I was talking to them two weeks ago and they're really struggling to get insurance. Um, and they're struggling to get it because the insurers are saying, you're not doing enough to protect against the risk of climate change. And therefore we as the insurer will have to take the cost. Um, it's a big, big example because Eskom is a much bigger um, company, obviously, than any of those that are in the room today, including our own. Um, but it is a significant issue. And, and um, the insurers just put their insurance premiums up as they... Hi all, um, <laughs> apologies for the pause. Our Wi-Fi just went down. As I mentioned earlier, um, we were in load shedding and our uh, generator stopped working just in time for the training. Um, so we are just changing over to our white mobile hotspots and it'll just be a moment. Thanks for your patience, uh, it won't take long.
Uh, I will just, while we wait for Belinda's um, connection to reestablish, I will just remind everyone, if you haven't already, please do share um, your name and your sector and your company in the chat box. If you're not too sure how to use the chat box, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a number of icons and one of them says chat. It's got a little um, speech bubble. So just click on that and the chat box will appear and you can type any questions you have there as well as introduce yourself. So yeah, just good to know everybody's sector so that we can have a great discussion later. Thanks all. It'll just be another moment or so. I can see them working on the technology now. <laughs> Right. Morning, colleagues. Um, sorry about the delay. I hadn't actually even realized I was just talking to myself happily um, for a while. Um, but I did hear Hilary apologize to you for again for Eskom. All right, so I'm going to try and share my screen again. Um, and it is, it is 5 to 10, so hopefully our lights will come on properly soon. So I'm really sorry for the disruption. Um, all right, so I was busy talking about loss and damage and Cyril has said to me that that's, um, I'd only been off for a couple of minutes. Um, so the, the loss and damage story colleagues is very much the KZN um, flood story, um, an extreme event, you know, like we had there with days of floods that cause, so in other words, a climate change disaster um, that can lead to shutdown of business facilities because people can't access them or the equipment gets broken or flooded out and um, tourist hubs get destroyed so hotels don't function in any case nobody really wants to go off to KZN for a holiday in the middle of a flood or straight after because everything is a mess and um, so the tourism industry gets um, affected um, coastlines get affected and businesses are prevented from operating temporarily and sometimes even permanently. Permanent damage being something that we've seen during COVID, for example, where people just actually can't sustain um, a business um, for the period of time that they can't earn income and that shuts the business down. And that's something we saw also from COVID. The relationship between the impact of COVID on businesses and the impact of climate change on businesses is very, very strong um, and all the more reason to go green. But as you can imagine, and I'm sure our hearing through all of this is that all of this brings opportunity for the construction um, and related industry manufacturing, et cetera, and all the services that all of you heard earlier and saw in the chat room are providing. Um, there is opportunity to, because everything needs to be fixed. It needs to be rebuilt. Um, it needs to be restored. And my message, my main message to you um, is that everything needs to be built back better, faster, and differently. Um, in other words, please don't think anymore about providing the services that you provide or constructing something in the same way that you did, because it, it's likely that it will not sustain um, the risks and impacts of climate change. And in the end, you would be affecting your own reputations um, for not being able to deliver the kind of service that people want. So in terms of sustainable solutions for businesses, um, the triple bottom line is, is the um, typical and now very well understood way of looking at um, how to be sustainable, um, which really means that you're combining people with economics um, with the environment. So people, planet and prosperity um, come together. So you can't just focus on people, you can't just focus on wealth creation, um, and you can't just focus on the planet, because if you're just pr pr protecting the environment but not worrying about what that means for people, um, you're not taking an integrated approach. And so this is what sustainability means, these three components. 
Um, and as I was saying, a sustainable business is not only concerned with profit maximization, it's also concerned with being socially responsible and protecting environmental and planetary resources, which is something many of you picked up on in our not meant meter session this morning. From a global perspective, um, and South Africa's part of this very Integri integrally, we signed the Paris Agreement, we've signed up for the Sustainable Development Goals, and we've developed climate change policy and strategies. Um, South Africa does this in three key ways. Um, so we look at adapting to climate change. We accept as a country that um, a level of global warming is inevitable. It's going to happen no matter what the efforts are, because we're already in that trajectory um, what's in the atmosphere is in there, you can't go and extract it. Um, and so we have to find ways to adapt, which really means making changes that will in, reduce the impact of climate change on people, systems and businesses. Then we also mitigate um, against climate change. In other words, what we're trying to do here is reduce the carbon emissions. Remember I said there's six greenhouse gases and they get um, measured back in terms of CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, so this is to slow down um, the level of global warming and, and reduce it. Um, and that we do by reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit into the atmosphere. And um, so for those of you that are changing to renewable energy sources or looking at energy efficiency measures, I think one of you mentioned, that you want to um, save your clients money through cheaper energy, you are also reducing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And in that way, you are also contributing to solving the problem and not only to responding to the problem. And that's excellent. Other ways of, so the ways of doing this would be to change to renewable energy sources. So using solar power, for example, instead of the ESCOM coal-based grid, um, reducing waste and recycling. And one of you spoke about this in the uh, Mentimeter session earlier, um, to reuse materials and recycle. That's um, what we would call a circular economy approach um, and or a green circular economy approach where what you take out, um, you reuse and you put back all the time. So you're circulating materials through the system and the system, I and mean, I'm going to go back there, the system being the people, planet and prosperity um, cycle of, of, re, of recycling and reusing. Um, the third way that South Africa is attempting to address the climate change problem is through making climate finance available um, to support these initiatives. So if you have a business, and we'll go through this later with a tool, but if you have a business that is um, directly addressing a climate change problem, so let's say, for example, you're um, uh, constructing um, or putting or selling or putting in place um, non-flush toilets, that means you're reducing water use um, and water scarcity is a direct function of climate change, um, you would then qualify for climate finance for that. If you are producing solar panels or installing solar energy systems, say solar water heaters um, in houses as part of your business enterprise, you would qualify for climate finance because that solar water geyser then displaces use of the electric grid, which is coal-based um, for using for, for um, producing hot water. So you now, instead of people using the ESCOM grid to produce hot water, which mainly comes from coal, which is a greenhouse gas, um, they're now using a solar water heater, so they're drawing from the sun. So you, you are now avoiding the use of the coal and, and reducing emissions. Um, and that business would also qualify for what we call climate finance. Um, the way that South Africa can channel climate finance from a policy perspective is through our contribution um, to the Global Paris Agreement, um, which as I said earlier was concluded in 2015. So the policy instrument is something called the nationally determined contribution, which outlines, and it's quick read. So if you want to look it up on the internet, um, Hillary can maybe post the link 
um, in the chat box, um, but basically our nationally determined contribution, which was revised last year, ahead of the climate negotiations in Glasgow, um, talks about climate change adaptation, the sectors that we're adapting in, how we, what our targets are for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, how we're making finance available, and the technology um, adjustments. So there's a policy instrument that enables the flow of climate finance to enterprises like yours. Um, so opportunities for businesses, um, and some of you have already identified these opportunities like reducing costs for clients through cheaper energy. Um, but it really, colleagues, I mean, the point of today, and this really does come to the nub of the um, training, the point of today is to really help you understand where these opportunities are. So please do you know, make a note of your questions or put them in the chat. We are here to try and help you. Um, and there are key areas um, where there are opportunities. One is for saving costs, as, as you've already mentioned, um, and understanding where you can save costs um, through climate change responses um, or risk prevention um, will enable you to make more informed investment decisions. In other words, um, just to think about where you invest your money better. Um, so you could, for example, be thinking, um, so maybe instead of paying Eskom a lot of money every month for electricity that isn't always there, I can install a solar system or an inverter system, and it's going to cost me a lot of money to do that, but that might give me returns in the longer term because it means I can continue to supply services to my clients in times where others that are totally dependent on the Eskom grid can't. Um, so that's a, a very broad example, but that cost saving is, is a difficult one because sometimes you require capital costs and not everybody has the lump sum needed to make the investment. But if you can make the business case um, to an investor to say, yes, it's going to cost me 30,000 Rand now, but I'll pay it back in two or three years and I'll be able to generate an income steadily, which I can't do at the moment. Um, and then the bank might actually lend you that money. You can also um, in, uh, decrease your future insurance costs, as we were talking about earlier, um, as well as other financing costs. Um, and then the next one I've already spoken about is ensuring business continuity. Um, so addressing the exposure to climate risks provides you with the best possible chance of continuing operations to meet demand um, and to minimize disruption which is quite interesting to be talking about right now because we've already had such disruption, but at least we've been able to continue. So those are two key areas, colleagues saving costs and being able to continue to operate your business. Now, key, key drivers for all of you. There are others, um, and one of you mentioned this this morning, um, is having a competitive advantage. So if you are doing something that's sustainable and, some, and your competitor is not, that gives you an advantage over your competitor, but obviously you would need to market that advantage and tell your clients that it exists. Um, and um, that in turn helps you to promote sustainability. So what you would need to be thinking about, and we can discuss this in the interactive session that Cyril does with you a little bit later, is to find ways to reduce your business costs. Um, and effectively manage climate risks so that you have that upper hand or competitive advantage over, over others um, in the same industry. Um, also, and this is related to the competitive advantage, is the positive reputation. Um, and again, you'd have to tell your clients that you're doing this so that they know that you um, are making an effort in the sustainability space. Um, but consumers and investors are really, I've said it already, they're putting the, the pressure from consumers and investors to behave sustainably is increasing. Um, and there's more and more of a drive to see businesses adopting sustainable practices that are environmentally friendly and doing that proactively um, is, is therefore likely 
to increase investor confidence and safeguard your reputation and also use that the reputation to get more business. This is particularly important for um, if you're part of a supply chain that is feeding into larger businesses like a Woolworths or a big construction company that is under the spotlight with their investors and you are helping them to achieve um, their goals of reducing risk, et cetera, it puts you in a stronger position. Um, so we also need to be looking at this from a supply chain perspective. Um, then there's the opportunity to create opportunities um, and so the demand and to respond to those. So the demand for sustain sustainable solutions is increasing. And we all know this, um, solar energy, as well as water saving initiatives are excellent examples because it's not, it's not only one driver or the other. Solar energy helps us and water saving initiatives help us deal with load shedding and with water shedding. In other words, they help us to enhance our electricity and water security um, in addition to responding to climate change. Um, so it's a very strong story and compelling story for an investor. In South Africa at the moment, where very few of us can function without some form of electricity or energy and nobody can function without water. All right, so that was a mouthful from me, um, but I think we can now go into a question and answer session. We will unpack a lot of the business opportunities in more detail as we go through the rest of the session. But I just thought we could stop and see if there are any um, questions and uh, points of clarifications or comments that any of you wish to make on the presentation you've heard so far. It's your turn. Um, and colleagues, there's a hand raise function if you want to use that. Otherwise, you can unmute your mics. And Hilary and Sarah will just help me monitor that. Hi, Belinda. Um, there's a question in the chat that I've just reposted. It came up a bit earlier. Okay. Uh, methane, this methane, nitrous oxide, etc. That's right. Yeah. All I right. So um, thank you for, for asking. There are, as we said earlier, six greenhouse gases, um, one of which is methane. So yeah, methane's an interesting one, so I'll dwell on that. Um, methane is, um, the question is how are these gases formed? So we know that carbon dioxide is formed through um, burning coal, um, which is you know, direct carbon dioxide producing. Um, gas methane, um, which I think is four times as strong in terms of its pollutant aspect than, than carbon dioxide. I mean, it's a very, very high pollutant. Um, interestingly, is produced from um, farming activities. So methane can be produced from livestock waste um, and is a very high emitter. And it's one of the reasons that um, uh, agriculture has been such a strong focus of agriculture and other land uses. Um, but agriculture in particular, because of its methane production, um, activities um, like livestock waste has been a very strong focus of climate finance and um, of um, climate change response interventions because methane is such a, a strong um, greenhouse gas. Um, the, I think another interesting example, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately because we've just been doing some work with a presidential climate commission um, going to communities that are impacted by climate change. And one of the, I mentioned Secunda and Durban South earlier. So Secunda has got the Cecil refineries and um, um, Cecil production facilities. And Cecil is with Eskom. Eskom and Cecil are the biggest producers of um, greenhouse gases in the country. So they're our biggest um, polluters in terms of climate change. But they also pollute in other ways, particularly Cecil and then the oil refineries in, in Durban South um, are producing greenhouse gases and they are producing um, local 
um, air quality emissions that are not greenhouse gases, but are contributing to health problems um, in those areas. So nitrous oxide or NOx um, and SOx um, are among those. So it's an interesting example because the air quality issues are not always directly related to the greenhouse gases that we measure in terms of climate change, but they cause significant health problems and they are produced as a function of using fossil fuels. So they are a sort of knock on from um, using fossil fuels and burning those fossil fuels. And um, the next question um, that I can see in the chat is how to convince someone to take a high initial cost for being green and taking savings over time. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question, Chumani, and, and maybe you can all help us answer this today um, because you're the ones that are the enterprises that are having to take these risks and, and wanting to safeguard against your risks. And I understand that. I've been running a small business for 20 years now. Um, and it's not an easy job. And I'm very, very aware of that. Um, so we're in a very different space to you. We're selling services rather than construction materials or, or energy services or plumbing. Um, but taking that risk is, is not an, it's not an easy thing to do. And so part of it is being able to build a business case, Chumani. And, and often for small enterprises, this is in itself a difficult thing to do because you're too busy worrying about providing services to your clients and maintaining your client reputation and also your own incomes. Um, and building a business case can take time. And it's one of the reasons we developed the toolkit that we want to take you through earlier is it's a quicker, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not quick. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that it is, but it's definitely a quicker way than trying to figure it out for yourselves in terms of how to build that business case. So we'll show it to you later. Um, but building a business case is important because that way you can convince yourself um, that, that this is a, an important risk to take because you'll have a look at the upfront cost. So let's use my example of, I mean, it's a small example, but let's say you installed a solar system at your um, operation and it cost you 50,000 Rand. Um, it's a big upfront cost. You'd have to work out uh, over how much time it'll take you to pay that 50,000 Rand back which obviously means you have to be generating sales to be able to do that. And so you would calculate um, how much time it would take you. Is it three years? Is it five years? Most finance institutions would accept five years, maybe at a push seven, but they really want to see payback within three, or three to five years max. Um, and at what point will you return or start profit, you know, clear profitability and have repaid that loan? Um, so being able to actually see that um, cash flow forecast um, that your sales actually could increase because you've made this investment um, and being able to see that in a fairly sort of solid um, way financially and economically um, and socially um, can help to convince you as yourself as the you know you the one that has to take the risk if you borrow the money that you've got to pay it back to the bank um, and the bank if you are going to a bank for for finance um, so that to me is one of the key ways but I think probably also important to accept that there is there's always going to be a leap of faith until this becomes mainstream um you know you, you part of having a competitive advantage and that's what we did as one world 20 years ago we went into this business people thought we were mad i mean i'll you know i'll be very blunt about that people would sit and say to me you're doing what um and why would you do that when you're earning a very good salary in the company you're in um i i mean you know it's it's very hard to convince people who are not used to seeing a particular way of doing things that this is going to be the way of the future and some people just have to stick their heads above the parapet and take that that risk um which is not for everybody um some people are, are more entrepreneurial than others others are better followers and we need both um but that leap of faith plus being able to show that you could actually pay this back um, and not be taking too big a risk um, is, is the combination, Chimani, <clears throat> of how we'd be looking at that. Um, 
And then Shimani, you've also said that sustainable materials can be very expensive and increase your costs and how do you, how do you deal with this? It's an excellent question. And actually we've been doing some work for a different piece of work to what I spoke about earlier for the African Development Bank um, to develop a credit facility where the bank will lend uh, money to businesses. So it's very targeted at small, medium enterprises. It's totally targeted at them. It's also targeted at the youth. Um, but they're wanting to make a line of credit available to businesses that are prepared to go down this road. Um, and one of the things we've been doing is a market assessment. <laughs> one of the findings has been exactly this, Chimani is that small businesses are saying, you know, we really want to do this, but the materials are more expensive. So, you know, if, if for example, you want to build um, houses out of hemp um, instead of concrete, um, it's more expensive in the initial phase. <clears throat> and again, you have to make that upfront costs, cost. Um, and my answer to you, Chimani, is again, I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. It's not easy, um, but it's doable. And um, there are banks, I mean, we've been talking to, and Cyril can maybe touch on this again a bit later, but we've been talking for this piece of work for the AFDB, we've been talking to a range of banks, um, for example, <clears throat> and they are prepared um, to make finance facilities easier to access for businesses that are prepared to go down this road. And that would help you, for example, to um, deal with the increased costs of the materials. And the way that that could happen is, and it's one of the things we're looking at with this facility, is to, for example, let's say you took a loan from the facility um, over five years and it had an interest rate of 8% um, and you had to pay back every month. There are two ways in that example that the facility could make it easier for you to finance those costs, either the upfront costs that we talked about just now, or the more um, expensive materials costs, is by giving you reduced interest. So maybe they reduce the interest rate from eight to three. I'm using a hypothetical example. So eight to three percent, so now you're paying much less interest. And in addition to that, they could be giving you a loan um, payback holiday. In other words, they could say, as part of the agreement, you need only start paying your loan back in six months time, which means you've got six months um, where you're not having that pressure of having to pay back the money as it were. Um, and that would be another way of dealing with this. So the, the financing instruments are key. And they are, the good news is that there are instruments that um, have emerged already and will continue um, to emerge through the work we're doing and others are doing in that, in that regard, in that regard, sorry. Um, uh, and then, Oh, these are just introductions. I think I've answered all the questions. Yeah, I think I've answered everything in the chat. Um, is there anyone that wants to talk to us with um, their voices and ask questions? Um, otherwise, I'll hand over to Cyril. Right, I don't see any hands. Um, but colleagues, we're here for a few more hours. So if you've got any other questions or points along the way, feel free. Um, we're not rigid people, so we'll try and respond as we go along. Um, and Cyril, um, I know I said that I would give you this, but I think it might just be easier. Well, you know what, so you can project um, from your screen and just use the slides that you have. And I'm wondering if we should give our colleagues a five minute break. Cyril, are you there? Uh, hi, Belinda. Uh, yes. So from our side, Hillary will project the, the slides. Uh, but yes, I think we can do a, a five minutes comfort break. Um, and then, yeah, just come back at half past uh, 10. So not to, to log off. Uh, just stretch the legs quickly, grab a cup of tea, and then we can come back in five minutes time.
Uh, good, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I hope you had a, a good quick break. Uh, just grab some tea. And uh, yeah, I think we're really looking forward to to sharing with you this second session this morning. Uh, I think Belinda gave a, a very good back background to the, the overarching uh, idea of climate change, how that affects our daily lives, our daily businesses. Uh, and I think really this, the, the focus of this session uh, the second session this morning is really to tease out some of those opportunities, opportunities for businesses. What can we do um, to really uh, promote uh, environmental sustainability, better use of resources uh, in a way that's good for, for businesses, good for consumers or uh, customers uh, and good for, for the environment? Um, and yeah, we really just want to tease out some of those uh, opportunities uh, this morning. Um, Hillary, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, just quickly to recap, uh, as Belinda explained in the in the previous session where we left off, uh, obviously there's lots of potential for for your businesses. Uh, in terms of cost saving, in terms of of new opportunities, setting yourself apart from from your your consumers, um, and what we wanted to do in in the session this morning, uh, we're gonna we're gonna run through two case studies. So I spoke to some of the colleagues that's on the line last week, in particular two companies. Uh, the first one, MTP Technologies. The second one is Sheba. Pro Electrical, uh, and we're going to share with you some of their uh, their operations, how their business works, some of the background, uh, and then really what we'll do uh, also talk through uh, some different ways um, their business in a more sustainable manner, things they consider methods they can use, uh, and then we'll go into into a, a breakout session. So we'll go into different virtual rooms. Uh, and really for for us as you know as we heard throughout the morning some of you are in in construction some of you are plumbing electrical uh, i saw there was some uh, in, in the timber industry as well uh, to have a discussion how these two companies mtp technologies and sheba pro electrical uh, can really increase their their sustainability uh, and then we'll we'll reflect a bit on on that uh, but maybe just to to tell you a bit about MTP Technologies, uh, and I'm very glad I see Ms. Jijane has has joined us this morning. Welcome to her as well. Very happy to to just share uh, a little bit about her business with with you. Uh, she started her company in in 2016 uh, with around uh, well to today she has around 15 employees. Uh, it's a construction business. So a large part of her, her business is foundation laying, plumbing, plastering, painting. Uh, she says she's also looking to uh, expand to include electrical installations uh, as, as her portfolio of, of services grows. Uh, her main clients are in the government sector, so different departments, um, ministries, also RDP housing, those type of proje uh, projects, uh, she says to date, there's very little demand from customers uh, actually asking for sustainable solutions. Again, I think this is something uh, we've heard to some extent this morning as well. Um, but she says she's looking to expand to two companies, private companies, two residential companies. Again, echoing what a lot of us heard from, from this morning. A lot of pe people looking for, for solar, a lot of people looking for ways in which we can save water. Uh, so certainly, I think that's something she'll she'll interact with going forward as well. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, I also asked her about, you know, how does she... Uh, marketer business and she said mainly through through word of mouth business brochures etc uh, so that's uh, MT, mtp technologies and on the right hand you can see uh, some of of Ms. jijana's colleagues installing a uh, sink plumbing um, taps etc uh, as well as some of the the construction projects she's been engaged with um 
Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, the the second project, uh, the second company I, I spoke to last week was Sheba Pro Electrical. Um, Sheba is, as the name suggests, an uh, uh, electrical installation company. They do uh, domestic uh, installations, industrial. They also supply electrical materials uh, to, to households, companies, uh, etc. Uh, and of course, I think one of their, their big things is uh, solar installations. Uh, Sheba Pro Electrical was started by Mr. Marke in 2016 uh, and to date he has four full-time employees uh, i know jabu told me that this morning he's uh, has another engagement uh, but he'll probably join us a bit later uh, later this morning um i think uh, as jabu explained to me a core part of his business is also doing appliance repairs uh, so whether that's stoves or washing machines etc uh, his clients are primarily households, um, and one of the interesting things he told me, uh, even since 2016, there's been a significant demand in terms of of solar systems and solar geysers uh, from from his his customers. Obviously, um, in response to to load shedding in in South Africa, uh, Jabu markets his business through online, so his website, social media, through brochures, and specifically referrals as well, word of mouth, uh, just clients that he's worked through before. Um, in the future, uh, Jabu hopes to expand his business by opening up new workshops, uh, as well as. Um, creating training services where he can train other young people uh, to to work with uh, within the electrical sector. Um, okay, next slide, please, Hilary. Um, so colleagues, essentially, those are, are the two case studies I just quickly wanted to share. Uh, and before we go into, into the, the virtual breakout rooms, um, I wanted to run you through just some examples of, you know, companies such as MTP Technology, Sheba Pro Electrical, uh, but even your companies as well, how you can uh, think about uh, examples of creating a more sustainable way of, of doing things. And obviously, uh, earlier, um, Belinda was talking about the triple bottom line, you know, um, in terms of managing profits, people, the environment, etc. Um, and again, for all of these examples I'm going to give you, uh, you can think about it uh, as, as that graph on the right hand shows uh, in terms of benefiting environments, benefiting your customers uh, and, and your business as well. Um, I think the, the first example I wanted to share with you is in terms of recycling. Again, if we think about these companies, there's a whole host of, of waste materials from packaging to wire to plastics, paper, etc. Uh, how can these businesses look at the waste that they produce um, to, to recycle that? Uh, make additional income for for their business from that, while at the same time uh, saving the the environment. Um, secondly, I think one of the examples these companies can consider is is repairing items. So once you repair items rather than than buy new stuff, it's not only good for the environment because you use less resources. Uh, but equally, it's good for, for your customers. You're providing a, a better and a cheaper service to them if you're fixing, say, an oven uh, rather than asking them to, to buy a new one. Um, reusing, again, something we've spoken about throughout this morning. Um, how can you be smarter about uh, the things you source to re reuse rather than buy uh, new items all the time? Um, and then here, I think when we talk about climate smart initiatives, again, let's think how companies such as MTP Technologies, Sheba Pro Electrical, uh, your own as well, how can you look at new products? And here specifically, I'm thinking about water saving taps or water saving toilets, um, products that use less natural resources, 
Um, again, you know, something we spoke about earlier that saves your customer money, also saves the environment money, also means that you're giving a good service to, to your customer. Um, then let's think about branding, marketing. Again, earlier this morning, we spoke about how we put uh one business at a competitive advantage to your competitor uh, so if you're operating in a sustainable manner how can you communicate that to to clients uh, so that's more attractive to them um, and then we talk about efficiency i think we can think within these companies within the way we work how can we work more efficient so that we use less natural resources. And here, I think an obvious example is just traveling. Uh, obviously, in a lot of these construction, plumbing, electrical businesses, uh, travel uh, is a big part of your cost. How can you cut down on your travel, which means uh, more savings for the business in terms of petrol costs, but it's also good for the environment in terms of less uh, carbon dioxide emissions from vehicles, for example. Um, then again, as we go into, into the next session, considering how these companies, opportunities for these companies to be more sustainable, um, let's think about sourcing as well. Again, we talked about um, sourcing of recycled materials. You know, when I install something, do I have to always buy new or can I use uh, recycled materials which again saves money for for the customer for the environment um and also you know how can i source products that's made locally you know as opposed to something that's imported from another country uh, obviously those imports they need to be shipped to south africa adds a whole lot of um carbon emissions to to the product um, so are there ways I can source uh, locally? Um, and then finally, uh, maybe, and this is similar to, to climate smart initiatives that we spoke earlier, but there's constantly new products, new technologies coming onto the market, new innovations that combat climate change, uh, innovations that's good for the environment and the long term also for, for your customers. Um, so again, colleagues, I think the next step is for us to, to go into two breakout rooms and, uh, you don't have to do anything on, on your side. Uh, we'll manage that process, um, from our side, uh, but essentially, uh, I want, uh, colleagues in the two rooms to, to have a discussion around what are the opportunities for, MTP Technologies, Sheba Pro Electrical, um, you know, looking at some of these examples, and I'll actually, I'll leave this slide up so you can refer back to them. Um, but really just to reflect on, on your own business as well. Again, um, some of, of our colleagues here this morning is, is in another industry, for example, carpentry. Uh, you know, what are some of the ways you can think of uh, how you can be more environmentally sustainable in in your operations um so yeah i think in in a few seconds we'll move into into those breakout rooms uh my colleagues well myself my colleagues here from from one world uh we will shift between those two two breakout rooms just to listen in on the conversation um, but I also want you to to just take some notes of of those discussions, uh, because after I think probably we'll give about 10, 15 minutes for for those discussions, uh, then we'll all come back into into this uh, main room um, and just get some feedback. You know, what are some of the, the suggestions we heard throughout the discussions on on opportunities for for these SMEs? Um, if you have any questions throughout the process, uh, as always, please feel, please feel free to, to use the chat function. Uh, we'll be here to assist. Um, but yeah, I think next steps, happy for us to, to go to the breakout rooms um, and then just reflect on opportunities for, for these two businesses. All right, thank you, Cyril. Um, I am going to, in a moment, automatically move you into two different breakout rooms. 
we've tried to get a mix, try to mix it up so that um, each room has people from various sectors. Um, so if anything comes up on your screen asking you to move into a room, please just accept. And then just keep an eye on your screen while you're discussing because I will send our sort of broadcast to both groups to let you know, you know, when the, when the time is coming to an end so that you don't get cut off mid-sentence and brought back to the main plenary. Okay, you should all be able to move back to the main session by yourself if you need help from me. I'll be here in the main room. And I'm opening the room now, so enjoy your discussion. Good morning, colleagues. Can you all hear me? Uh, I see we're in. Hello, uh, Cyril. Uh, sorry, Cyril. Um, you, I moved the wrong Cyril profile. Let me just add you real quick. There we go. Yeah, I'm signing you to room two. You logged in twice.
Hi, Hoplan. Um, we are currently in breakout groups, so I'm going to move you over to a group. Um, they're busy discussing um, ways that um, opportunities for SMEs to be more, you know, environment, environmentally sustainable. Apologies. I'm going to assign you to a group now. It should move you automatically. Back. Welcome back, colleagues. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was part of, of one of the, the groups now. I think we had a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, people had some really nice ideas on, you know, what companies can do uh, to reuse, recycle new technologies, efficiency. Uh, but before I share that with you, uh, I'm, I'd be interested to hear from uh, one from one of the other groups as well. Uh, if there's maybe somebody from the other groups that will volunteer uh, just to share some of the the discuss the discussions. Uh, what are some of the uh, key points uh, in the discussion that you want to share with other colleagues? Um, so happy to to take any volunteer. Uh, okay, I see uh, Mr. Patrick uh, has volunteered. Uh, please, sir, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let me, let me just let me just be sure. Let me just be sure. Because I must tie up their peers. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we Hello. can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Um, what I was trying to do here, I was, I was, I was, I was just checking. You, 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 you wanted, you wanted us to, uh, maybe to, 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 to talk the ideas that we have, or, or, or maybe I didn't. I, I, I think it looked like I missed that, and I was trying to mute myself. But then it appears as if I was volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i'm putting you a bit on the spot now but no i mean i think that's that's exactly it i mean um maybe even not necessarily from the group discussion but just from from your own you know uh what do you think are are ways in which you know either these companies stp technology or sheba uh, pro electrical or your own company for that matter what are ways you think you can incorporate into your business that will help it be more environmentally sustainable? Um, did you have any ideas or suggestions around that? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I think. I think I do. I think the most. The most important thing that. Uh, 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 that can 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 be done. Eh? Is to make sure that uh, we, we we every everything everything that we use for for our business or for uh, for our production, we must try to be a hundred percent in environment in environment environment friendly for 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 for, for whatever thing um, that we do. And then, if maybe we can, we can, we can, we can again. Uh, the different between the different companies try to 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 play a very unique and a vital role, especially to these uh, recycle collectors. Uh, and then, I think that 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 thing alone it will uh, it will bring uh, the difference even to the environment. Because the the environment the, the environment issue is a very serious problem. Because now, uh, it, 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 the situation that we 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 are facing now, it's a very complex situation. Just check for an example now, in um in in Quebec, Eastern Cape, we we are having the 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 water crisis because of because of this climate change, this environmental uh, 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 situation. So. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my take. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was uh, exactly our discussion as well. You know, in in the other group, 
um, it was, you know, similar things to what you mentioned around uh, recycling or reusing products, you know, using water resources uh, effectively, you know, again, the example from um, from the Eastern Cape came up uh, in, in our group as well. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about was also Jojo water tanks. Um, and then interestingly, you know, part of our group discussion was also around exploring different technologies, you know, new climate friendly technologies um, that can improve the way we do sorry, can improve the way we do business, uh, but also makes costs for, for us and our clients cheaper, uh, as well as, as the environment. Um, so really, those were, were key points uh, from, from our discussion. Uh, and then maybe the, the one last one I need to mention is around um, efficiency, business efficiency within the companies. You know, and the example that came from, from our discussion there uh, was in terms of leak detecting, you know, many of, of colleagues in, in this call today are plumbers, uh, you know, how can we use technology that will help us detect leaks quicker, faster, so it means there's less wastage of water, uh, we can fix it quicker, which takes less of, of our time, but it also costs less money for, for our client. Uh, so how can we, we look at that? Um, so, Colleagues, thanks, thanks for that brilliant discussion. Uh, I'm just going to ask my colleague Hillary to quickly share uh, the last two two slides for for this session uh, before we we have a, a short break again quickly. Um, uh, thank you. Um, the next slide, please, Hillary. Um, Yes, so just following on that discussion, I think um, I just wanted to uh, talk again about some of the solutions. Obviously, a lot of these came up in in the breakout groups now, as we heard from from Patrick and also from from myself in the group that that I was part of. Um, but I just wanted to to give you this this example. And again, I mentioned this to to Ms. Jajane, who's the director of MTP Technologies. Uh, so last week, when when I spoke to her uh, about her company, she mentioned, you know, uh, they're thinking about doing things environmentally friendly, but you know, she's keen to keen to explore it more. Um, and then she sent me, I asked her to send some, just some photos uh, of, of her product uh, projects. And as you can see, uh, that's uh, the house that's built there. It has a, a Jojo tank at, at the back. And, you know, for me, this is, is a perfect example of, of how we can use natural resources in a better way. The water gets collected from the from the roof. It runs into the the Jojo tank. We can reuse it later. Uh, it's fresh, clean water, uh, but it's not just all washing away. Uh, so again, I think these are are the kind of initiatives that that we can think of. Uh, it's good for the environment to reuse the water. It's good for the client. Yes, we did talk earlier about maybe initial extra capital cost, but it's good for the client because they get to to save water as well. And it's good for for you as a business because maybe you're offering a service that uh, other competitors don't offer. So really, I think it's it's these type of of solutions that that we can think about integrating in in our business. Uh, I also have their uh, water saving plumbing, uh, uh, plumbing, sorry. So taps, toilet heads, shower heads, anything that kind of restricts the flow of water. Again, it helps save your client money by lowering their water bill. Uh, it helps your business by offering maybe a service that, that other companies don't. And of course, it, it saves the, the environment. Um, and then again, I think, one of the interesting things that came from our discussion is there's constantly new technologies, new uh, building products coming on the market that is more sustainable. So the one uh, one colleague in our group spoke about bricks that's made from recycled materials, you know, paper, cardboard boxes, etc. Uh, also, and this is a, a tentative, but bricks kind of building bricks made from 
recycled tires you know constantly new products will will come on the market uh, and and really business owners should be constantly aware of of these changing um technologies so that you can incorporate that into into your business uh next slide please hillary um, and then just a, a quick reflection again on Sheba Pro Electrical. Uh, again, one of the things we spoke about in, in our company was, was recycling materials. So everything from steel, lead, copper. Uh, I think part of that discussion was, you know, um, recycling in a responsible manner uh so not just throwing away stuff that can still be used so if something can still be used uh you know maybe you can just think about replacing a washer or a rubber uh reuse that rather than just sending that off to the the scrapyard uh earlier we talked about sourcing locally we talked about climate smart solutions and again you know often we talk about solar pv solar geysers uh but we can also think about something like led D lighting, you know, uh, it's something that uses significantly less electricity um, than traditional lighting, which means your customer saves uh, costs on on their electricity bill. We use less uh, kind of dirty electricity from from ESCOM, which is great for the environment. So solutions like that uh, is really cross cutting um, for environment clients and businesses um and then also i mentioned earlier repair and here uh, we see a photo from sheba pro electrical you know sometimes there's just kind of a fuse that went or a loose wire so instead of replacing that product we can just look to to re, uh to repair it um i think one of the things when i spoke to jabu earlier uh, that he mentioned is he's constantly in training. Actually, this morning is in a in a training session as well, um, learning about new market opportunities, new products, new ways of doing things. Uh, because certainly that's a demand from from his clients as well. You know that that he needs to know what's going on. Um, we spoke about marketing earlier. Um, you know how can you use the fact that your business is is sustainable to communicate that to clients um because often clients are increasingly going to want to see that you know you're doing business in in a responsible manner uh, and then accreditation is something we'll touch on uh, a little bit later in the second uh, the the third and the fourth session this afternoon again um but really i think that's that's a key part of it as well to um to like communicate to the market that Sheba Pro Electrical or or um, Mr. Jana's business uh, are doing things in in a responsible manner. Uh, but again and again this this question around accreditation did come up in in our session uh, and it's something we'll talk to uh, towards the end of of today's training. Um, but colleagues, I think I'm gonna leave leave it there for now. Um, I'm gonna bring this session to to a close. Uh, I think when when we come back, we're really gonna get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how do we uh, check that our businesses are uh, resilient to the risks of of climate change uh, on the one hand. Uh, so we have a tool that we're gonna run you through. Um, again, reflecting on on these case studies, um, and then really how in the the last session of this morning is how can we integrate those into into our businesses? Um, so with with those two concluding remarks, colleagues, I think I'm going to bring this session to an end. Um, we're going to go for a quick break. Um, so I'm going to ask colleagues to just stay on the line. Um, but uh, you can go have a cup of tea or you can just go uh, have a, a quick bite. I think uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but maybe I will ask colleagues to come back at 20 to uh, 12. Uh, so 11.40. Uh, so that's a 20 minute break. If you can just rejoin us, uh, then my colleague Belinda will take over again. Uh, and run us through through the toolkit um but yeah thanks colleagues uh and then we'll join you again in 20 minutes
Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I hope you all had a good break, uh, grabbed a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Uh, thank you for, for joining us again this morning um, for, for the next two modules. Um, yep, as I mentioned at, at the end of our last session, we're going to really talk about uh, just climate screening for, for your business. Uh, and then also just really how you can integrate some of these uh, opportunities we mentioned throughout this morning, how you can integrate those into, into different uh, facets of, of your business. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over back to my colleague, Belinda, uh, who's going to run us through, through the toolkit uh, and just show colleagues how, how to use it, how to apply it to your business. Thank you, colleagues. So well, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good break um, and recharged your, your minds and your brains. Um, as Cyril mentioned, uh, we'll be taking us through the climate risk screening toolkit. Um, perhaps just to start by saying it's not only risk, it's a climate risk and opportunity screening toolkit because we're looking at both ends of the spectrum in terms of green businesses. Um, and as I also mentioned earlier, we developed this toolkit about a year and a half to two years ago um, for the African Development Bank um, and the credit facility that I was talking about earlier and um, that we're busy with at the moment um, for the African Development Bank was informed partly by the outcomes of using this toolkit and the research that went behind it. Um, it's a toolkit that, as you can hear, we developed for all of Africa. We piloted it in six countries um, at the time, and South Africa, of which South Africa was one of them. And at the moment with the project for developing the credit facility, which I saw in the chat, um, one or two of you were interested in, um, that we are using... Um, a moving number of um, case study countries to inform that one of them is South Africa and that doesn't move. So South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, experiences from those countries are informing the design of the facility. Um, so in other words, we tested the tool with South African businesses um, at the time of its development and we've used it since then in a number of situations as with today. Um, and we're also using the results to inform the credit facility. So colleagues, this is a training session. We're not here to um, research the credit facility, but obviously anything that you have to say um, that's useful to designing the credit facility, we will take into that process because you are our target audience or you're among the target audience for the African Development Bank's um, facility. So the purpose of the toolkit um, is to, I'm sorry, Cyril and Hillary, there are people waiting in the lobby. If you could please let them in, that would be great. Um, the purpose of the toolkit is to enable a business. So it's for the end user. You would be the end user, small businesses. It's there to try and make your lives easier in terms of being able to um, assess risk and opportunity. And, and just to go back to Chimani's question earlier in the chat room, um, the, one of the big intentions of the toolkit is to help you develop a business case and understand whether you even have one, um, to be going into um, a more of a green business space. Um, and if you do have a business case for the green business space or climate change, space then to see what finance opportunities are available to you because there is this thing that I was mentioning earlier called climate finance um, which is money that's specifically targeted to investments that enable um, progress towards um, global climate change objectives. So with that in mind colleagues the toolkit is there to enable businesses to identify and develop sustainable business ideas and initiatives that align with national climate change strategies and objectives. The reason for that is so that you know that you've got a policy framework behind you um, that helps you also to access finance because you're aligning with um, government policy. Um, and that's what one would call the enabling policy environment. And this always helps with um, accessing climate finance. Um, secondly, it's to help you climate proof your business. And this is particularly 
in the cases of businesses that are impacted by climate risk. So, you know, like I spoke earlier about the mines um, that are facing heat issues, um, it's intense heat issues and the costs of doing business for them are increasing as a result. So in other words, heat stress is a climate risk for those businesses, as is flooding, by the way. So the mines are getting it from, from all angles. Um, and so they're having to look in that example at how to climate proof their businesses, um, which basically means integrating climate change into and climate change impacts into how you construct, how you do your plumbing, how you provide energy services, um, how you build a road, how you, you know, build any kind of infrastructure or maintain any kind of infrastructure. In other words, the specifications um, which in the installation repair and maintenance realm of businesses that we're dealing with today is, is key. Um, that word specifications, um, specifications have to change. Um, and this is something that you could be leaders on um, and environmental cost leaders, which is a concept we'll come back to at the end of this, in the last module, at the end of this training course. So climate proofing um, against risk, and also being able to climate proof your clients, um, infrastructure assets or businesses, because you're part of a value chain or supply chain is also an important um, opportunity. Um, then thirdly, um, a key purpose is to be able to demonstrate through using the tool how to integrate climate response strategies into business operations. Um, and lastly, or second last, is to help you think through the climate rationale, um, which has been highlighted here. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to overwhelm people today. I don't want to frighten you with concepts. But I do want to just highlight that if you do want to access climate finance, um, one thing you have to demonstrate to the climate financier, in other words, the people that are providing the climate finance, you have to demonstrate that this really is a climate change based business. And that's what we mean by the climate rationale in your case. In other words, you will be, would be able to demonstrate that you are directly addressing climate change, which Jabu's business, for example, is directly doing. Um, he's, he's working in, um, through his electrical business, he's working in renewable energy, for example, so those aspects are very clearly um, climate change related and there would be a climate rationale there. We'll go through this in a bit more, more detail. Um, so those are the key objectives of using the tool, but basically, colleagues, just to recap, it's there to help you um, develop your business case and to go back to Chimani's really important question, to help you to convince yourselves and others that this is a climate change or a green business, um, and therefore it should attract finance um, and interest as well as be attractive to a client base that's interested in sustainability issues. Um, and therefore would be more inclined to give you the business as opposed to your competitor, as we spoke about earlier, because you're doing it and they're not, um, to put it really, really simply. Um, so just a quick overview, and then I'm actually going to go off the, um, after this I will go off the um, presentation and into the Excel, um, which Hilary, I will share when I, well, actually not just yet, I think I'll first show the landing page on here. Actually, no, sorry to jump around. I'll use the Excel. So after the slide, I will go to the Excel. Um, so I'll need to just be able to share my screen. Um, but just to quickly say that um, before we go there, that the four key steps, I mean, I will go through it with you in a minute. In the um, toolkit, um, the first is to screen for climate risk and vul No, I'm not there yet. And um, the first is to screen for risk and vulnerability. And the second is to assess opportunities. Remember, we're talking both about climate risk and about climate opportunities. The third is to do a climate impact assessment. And here we use that cascading model that I was talking about earlier. Um, and the last step is to um, conduct a more comprehensive business risk and opportunity assessment. And ultimate output is a, a business case or not. I mean, not all businesses qualify, um, but the ultimate um, is that business case. So 
it's not that um, a couple of things just to say before I go through it. Um, it's not that the it's not that the tool gives you your entire business case. You usually would still have to do a business plan for a financier um, and demonstrate certain things and turn it into a narrative, but it gives you the materials um, to be able to do that. Um, and it does quite a lot of it for you. So it's an interactive tool, but it's got some set calculation parameters in it, and it does the calculations for you. And I will show you that. Um, colleagues, because this is a training session that's, you know, ends at 1.30, so um, in an hour and a half's time, roughly, um, we obviously can't go into the tool in great detail, but we'd be interested to hear whether it's something um, you would like to have access to and, um, and if you would like to use more of, and we can also think about how to make that possible for you. Um, but the point for today is to use it as a training mechanism rather than to actually conduct an assessment on, on any of your businesses. So I just wanted to make that clear. And um, Hill, if you can go off screen share so that I can share my Excel, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and I'll just make it a bit bigger. Right, so as you can see, colleagues, this is an Excel, um, highly interactive. Um, we've tried to make it as easy to use as possible. I'm sure there's always room for improvement, um, but it's, it's, it is there to be very, very sort of user-friendly. Um, and I think I could just make my screen slightly bigger. But, um, Cyril or Hil Hillary, can you just comment? Is that a manageable size? Maybe a little, little bit bigger, but we can't see it well. I don't, I'm happy. I mean, I've got a massive screen here. All right, let's see how that goes. All right, so colleagues, this is the first page. Um, it's what we call the instructions or landing page. And it gives you an overview of the tool. Um, so it's, I won't go through all of it, um, but it starts with giving you a welcome and the purpose, um, which I've already been through. Um, and then it gives you instructions for using the tool. Um, there's seven steps under those four broad steps that I was highlighting earlier. There's seven um, individual steps in the toolkit. Um, and each step is a tool within the entire toolkit, but they're all linked together. So the calculations sort of accumulate um, across the tool. Um, and the purpose of each tool um, is outlined at the beginning of each of the spreadsheets. Um, but I think the important thing to say is that it provides you a stop-go decision-making point at various points. Um, of using the tool. One of the things what, that we wanted to avoid when we developed the tool was to avoid businesses that were not going to qualify for the green um, and climate finance space to be able to just stop using the tool and, and, um, and get on with doing their, their jobs. Um, but then differently for those that do demonstrate potential to be able to continue through the tool and invest more time. So there are these stop go points, they're the orange blocks in the diagram, um, and there are two of them. So the first step, as I said earlier, is risk and vulnerability screening. I'm going to go through that with you today, just to think about from your business perspective, and I'll apply the two case studies that we've had from Jabu and Tandiwe, and thanks again to both for making themselves available to make this work. I think it's very, it's great for everybody to have some very practical examples. So we'll go through the risk and vulnerability, which is based basically about assessing climate risk. Like will flooding affect your business? And if so, what can you do about it? Um, that brings us to the second step, which is the opportunity assessment. Um, and at that point, after the scores that you receive in the tool on those, you decide whether or not it's worth conducting a more detailed risk and opportunity assessment. If the decision is yes, it's worth it, and we give some thresholds in the tool, then you will do the climate impact assessment, which would be critical for your funding application if it's for climate finance. Um, equally, if it's for ESG, environmental and social and governance finance, um, you would need to do that impact assessment. Um, and from there, you would do the business risk and opportunity assessment, 
which would really enable you to identify risk reduction strategies um, for operationalizing the identified business opportunity in your business. And I'll walk us through that briefly. And that brings us to the last or the second stop go point, um, which is basically determining if the climate adaptation risk strategy or opportunity is worth pursuing. Um, and that's a cost benefit analysis, um, which is a fairly high level cost benefit analysis in the tool that it gives you enough information to be able to know whether or not you need more detail on that or whether you've got enough of a business case to present. But it addresses the costs and benefits we've talked about, you know, environmental, social, um, as well as from a climate change perspective. Um, and then also, you know, looking at things like reputation, um, reducing your input costs, all the kinds of things you spoke about earlier. Um, the one I won't, I'm not going to take walk, I'm not going to go through the cost benefit analysis today, I'll just explain it. Um, and what I also won't do today is the greenhouse gas emissions reduction tool, which is about quantifying um, emission reductions as well as identifying emission reduction strategies for your business. So Patrick, for example, I was asking you in the breakaway group earlier, um, what, what materials you were thinking about using um, to shift from what you're using at the moment. And I know you were doing very early research. I'm definitely not putting you on the spot again here, but the point is that the tool is supposed to help you identify what those options could be. There's a lot of resource material in the tool, colleagues. So there's links to um, information and resources. If you are doing research, the tool also helps you to point you in the right direction. Um, not on absolutely everything. It wasn't possible to cover absolutely everything, as you can imagine, um, but it does give a good starting point. And then, colleagues, the final um, step in the tool is to um, look at the finance opportunities. Um, it's a checklist. Um, and it's, it takes you to a point of whether or not you actually need to go and do a carbon footprint, um, which is a more detailed analysis. And it's a level of complexity we would not willingly send businesses down the road of unless they were very much um, in line for climate finance for reducing carbon footprints. Um, so it's another stop go point. It's just not highlighted as such. Um, just um, if you do use it, and I'm going to approach this today in a similar way, it's very helpful to work with others. Um, when you're applying the tool, it's just nice to brainstorm. It's nice not to be doing it on your own. Um, it's less overwhelming. Um, and it's just great to be able to have the debates and the discussion and to think about is it like this or is it like that? You'll see as we go through it. Um, and also to say that you may not be able to complete every step of the tool, and that's fine. You fill in what you can and you see how far you're able to get, um, but always useful to evaluate your overall results at the end. And I think um, for those of you that are going down this road of um, green businesses, and, and there are many of you that are doing it, it's a nice way of also tracking your progress over time. Um, so are you increasing your score over time? Therefore, are you um, actually increasing the green aspects um, of your business? Um, all right, there's a glossary page, um, which gives you um, an, uh, an overview of the different terms, like saving costs and ensuring business continuity, competitive advantage, positive reputation. These are all things we've spoken about today. Um, that those are the sort of more businessy things that we all understand. We all know what it means to save costs and to enhance your reputation. But then on the left hand side, there's the more technical type of terminology that we don't all understand, like what is climate change, you know, what is sustainable development goals, what are the impacts, what are the risks, all the things that we've presented today. Those, that information is in, is in the tool. So this is also, as I said earlier, a resource that you can use. If you are going um, the carbon footprint route, in other words, if your business is about producing greenhouse gases, um, you could also be looking at the greenhouse gas um, specific terminology, a lot of which we've also spoken about today. But as I said, um, there's a level to how far, there's a limit to how far we can go today. 
Um, and I don't want to make this overwhelming for you, but just to explain what's there. So that's the glossary. Um, there are very nice little quick buttons so that you can press or you can do what I'm doing, which is just jumping across to different worksheets. Um, but you can always either go back um, or you can go start step A, which is what we are going to do at the moment. And let me again make this a little bit bigger. All right. So this is the first, um, and this is important to do this screening um, uh, checklist, and it gives you a score at the end. I'll take you through it. It's very simple, um, colleagues. The purpose of this checklist is just to highlight um, if there are any key impacts that climate change may have on your business. So, you know, Hello, maybe Hello. for it, yeah. Sorry, could you go a little bit closer, please? It's still a bit hard to read. I can't make it much bigger, but I'll try. Is that better? Larry? Yes, that's a bit better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Hills. Um, all right, so what was I saying? I was saying that um, what this tool is really trying, this part of the tool is trying to do is make you think about climate risk. I mean, you might know that there's increase in flooding, but you might never have thought about what that means for your business. You might have heard about this thing called global warming, but you might never have thought about what that means for your business. So it's really to try and, um, I don't want to use the word force, but it's, it really is to try and engage you in, in thinking about um, those risks. So it asks you very simple questions um, that are down here on the left-hand side. Um, so we start with general awareness for the business. Um, and we are thinking here about things like what impact would flooding in your area have on your business? Um, is it a, if you don't know, you, you put in, I don't know, and then, um, so you would choose from a filter, which is not, oh, it's because I'm in screen share mode. Okay, I forgot that part. Um, but you would choose from a filter, so this drop down menu gives you naught or two, um, and that's where this ball comes from. So this particular business colleagues, it is, it is working, okay. So this particular business um, was a, a, in the water and sanitation area. So it was a business for um, installing um, waterless toilets. I mentioned the example earlier um, and the business concerned, we took them through the toolkit, they said that flooding would have an average impact on their business. Um, so it would have issues in terms of the plumbing systems that they were using and, um, and also some potential impacts for the actual construction of the toilets. But, so, but they didn't give it a significant impact. And they gave it a, a, an average impact through this drop down menu. So if they said, Nought it would have changed in that way. So that was a two. And um, then they said that in the question of what impact would increased temperature or a heat wave in your area have on your business, they said there would be no impact there. If it were a business, and we did do one like this that was very reliant, it was an agriculture business, they were very reliant on roads for access to market um, and in the area it was in the northern cape they had experienced both heat stress and flooding as an impact on roads and they, they actually gave both of these a significant impact score as a result um, so if any of you are in the mood and would like to please write in the chat room and um, what you think your answers to some of these questions would be. So floods, you could just go flood slash two um, or flood, flood slash naught. So you can see that the scoring system is either naught or two. Um, and you can say if it's no impact, average or significant, if you would like to just think through um, this um, for, for your business. But I will just, just now call on Tindiwe and Jabu if they're here. Um, to think it through in terms of their case studies. And then we look at the question of what impact would drought have on your business. Um, in this particular case, it was a two, so it was significant. Um, and bushfires, which are another climate change consequence. This was also, and I'm sorry, this was not the waterless toilets. Um, that was the one I was going to show you. This was um, a business in Mpumalanga. Um, for restoring degraded mining land. 
Um, so business opportunities for actually rehabilitating mining land. Um, and they, this, um, they were thinking about these questions in terms of how much those, these issues would interrupt their continuity of doing business and therefore it would be a risk. So if there was a bushfire, they would not be able to um, clean the land um, and plant, replant with vegetation. If there was a flood, the same. Um, but they felt that they could in, work in, in hot temperatures. My apologies for, for that mistake. Um, and then also looking at questions of wind speed and storms in your area um, and how what kind of impact that would have. Um, Tandiwe and Jabu, if you are here, what I will be doing is asking you just now if you'd like to comment on any of these questions insofar as your business is concerned. I'm not going to take you through the whole tool, but just any comments from you, but let me finish going through this first. So the second category of questions here is awareness of climate risk and impact. Um, so we ask questions like, have you considered the potential impacts of climate events such as flooding? or heat waves on your business um, and in your business planning and strategy. Um, and I know from talking to Patrick earlier that he, for example, is at a very early stage, he is thinking about it. Um, and so Patrick, in your example, I would have thought that we would probably go partially um, and give a score there or, or maybe even yes. Um, although you said you were at an early stage, which is why I was thinking partially. Um, and then we're asking about the potential impacts of um, flooding or heat waves on your potential markets and your suppliers in your business planning. And colleagues, the answers that you see here, which are pretty much zero throughout, that was something we experienced in almost every SME that we've taken this tool through. So many had, you know, could understand the impact. So the general awareness, they could understand that but very few actually had translated those risks into real impacts for their business or into their business plans. But what it did do was make people think about it. And actually I had a follow-up meeting um, two months ago with the mine, mine rehabilitation business that I was talking about just now that this particular exercise is calculated against. And um, they, as a result of having been through this, um, have started putting these things into their business plans. Um, and not taking the business much further as a result. And that was about a year after um, having been through the tool. Then there's a series of questions on climate risk management. So these are questions around, have you taken out insurance against flooding or droughts um, or other extreme events? Um, or have you actually put in place particular operational measures um, to mitigate or to reduce the risks of a flood or a fire. Um, and then the last set of questions asks you to prioritize risks. Um, and here the question is, would you consider the risks that climate hazards pose as equally important risks to your business as potential market and financial risks? Um, and again, the results you see here, the one that the mining rehabilitation business gave, um, we've pretty much seen across, across the board. Um, that said, mining operations um, really answer very differently. They've already been experienced severe impacts of, of flooding the, and heat waves that just stop their business operations completely. So that kind of... Um, assessment would need to come into, into your thinking. Um, and then the last question was also just to help us because we gather data um, from this um, is, have you ever considered the potential impacts that climate events would have on your business before now? This is just to try and understand the level of awareness and, and understanding what's going on. Before I go to Tandiwe or Jabu, I just want to show you how the scoring works. Um, so there's a, a uh, total score that accumulates here that's calculated from um, the table above um, that gives you an overall score. Um, and also there's a spider diagram that shows where you, you fit in the spectrum. So what we saw from this particular business was that they had a very high awareness um, of, of climate change issues. So that was 80%. Um, of the answers were in that direction, very low, no awareness of climate risk. 
some awareness of how to manage the risk and a, a lowish level of awareness as to how to um, prioritize risks. So before I go to the next um, screen, Tindi Wei, um, or, or Jabu, I'm not sure if Jabu's with us, I know Cyril said he was not necessarily going to be here. Um, Tindi Wei, I see you are here. Are they, would you be able to give us some insights um, just for the sake of the participants from your perspective as to how you might answer some of these questions? And you can choose anyone that you would like, um, please. Tindiwe, are you there? I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, otherwise, Cyril, I'm going to ask you to comment from Jabu's perspective. Well, either while Tim, somebody's drawing lines on my slide, it's interesting. Um, okay, yeah. Oh, Tindiwe, are you okay. there? Yes, I'm there. Actually, okay, let me just be honest with the okay, with the checklist. Uh, on my side, I haven't done the checklist as yet. So I think maybe I can work on to trying to check maybe on working on it to check how can i go about it because i haven't had the checklist like on my business to be honest on my, on my side but uh, i don't know whether you want me to just check on what you just have here and then just maybe give an uh, example Yes, Tandiwe, that's all I'm looking for. Um, I mean, do the checklist in your own time, but today it would be nice just to hear some, any of your thoughts on some of these questions and how they impact your business or how you think they would. And okay, I think with, okay, I'll take the one for the flats, which I think it's, it's the one that's it's very more, uh, it's the most that we need to take as our, uh, on the business because of, we don't look too much into it because of when the climate change, we don't uh, have any measures that are in place for our businesses. And um, it's more important, more especially if you don't have insurances, that's going to cover all the damage that that's going to come after the flood. So I think in most small businesses, that's what we need to look into. So, yeah. Okay, so are you saying, Tundi, where that you think flooding might be a risk that you need to think about? I mean, I'm imagining yes. for people. To be who... honest, on my business, I think that's the yeah. that's the okay. most that I can take. Okay, so hold that thought, please, Tundi, where for when we go through the subsequent aspects of the tool, um, because that question will come up in a different way, um, and we can take the the flood risk um, further. So that just helps also for me to build an example out as we go through this. Um, thanks very much, Tindi Wei, um, for being willing. Uh, Cyril, are you able to provide some insights or comments from Jabu's perspective? I know you had a, a good discussion with him. Yeah, Belinda, I think, I mean, in terms of, of Jabu, I mean, he, uh, as we mentioned, his core business is installing solar panels. So I imagine something like temperature increase, right? Um, you know, his employees working in the sun, uh, obviously that's good for the generation, but one also had to consider the impact on, on employees when installing, when installing this. Um, and maybe just one other remark that I, I wanted to add here, uh, you know, throughout this morning's session, we, we constantly talk about initiatives that looks at what's good for the environment, that's good for your business, but also good for your clients. Uh, and what's nice about this tool is also considering, you know, how would something like heat waves impact on, on your business and your client, you know, something like floods, how would that impact? Uh, so I think that's a nice way to kind of tie together those, those three elements as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's all from my side. Thanks very much, Cyril. Um, so colleagues, both of those um, examples that Tandiwe and Jabu have given via Cyril um, talk about two key climate parameters, right? One is um, flood, flooding events, um, and we've, we've all seen enough of the trauma of KZN to know that that's a significant issue. And it's, we know that this is why green industrialization is taking um, some of these issues really seriously because they present risk. So imagine if it's heat stress, which is the Jabu, um, Jabu's business example where Cyril is saying that solar installations 
um, just the act of installing in a heat um, stress situation would be limiting. So that's a risk for the business that breaks continuity. Um, and that's another key risk that financiers are taking into consideration. Um, so the knock-on effect, if you're part of a supply chain of a big business or big industry that's, that's taking these matters seriously, um, then, the, then those risks need to be climate-proofed, to use earlier the term that I, I raised earlier into your business. Um, but they can also provide opportunities. And so that's what we are going to look at next. Um, so here's the opportunity assessment. And I know that Hillary's going to tell, tell me to make it bigger, so I'll do it all by myself. Um, right, I hope that works for colleagues. Sorry. Okay, so the opportunity assessment. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling back up. So this asks questions aimed at assessing the alignment of your business um, to green and climate finance objectives and criteria. And um, so it asks you to assess your business against the sustainable development goals. Um, if you find that there's weak alignment or you don't know, um, then we're suggesting that you rethink your business plan or strategy. Um, so colleagues, the, the theme here, or the, the, the thought basis here, logic, that we're taking all the way through this is just always make sure there's alignment. Um, so if you want to go green, you can. Um, there's always opportunity. Um, but if you want to keep demonstrating that you are green, either to your clients because you want to enhance your competitive advantage, or to a, a finance institution because you want to increase access to climate finance, you just need to keep demonstrating your argument. Um, and that's what this is about. Um, so you can't just go and tell a client that you are green now, you need to be able to prove it to them. And that's part of the objective here. Um, and, and it's something you have to do every step of the way. And these questions come up all the time. So we are looking at, you know, the sort of policy alignment and so the sustainable development goals and the nationally determined contribution, but also as to whether or not this opportunity makes economic sense um, so that it doesn't cost you um, more than you can make back. Um, because we are not trying to contribute to increasing poverty here. Um, so the economic sense is important. And the question is, in, is both can you make it economically viable, but also how to make it economically viable, which was some of the questions that were coming through this morning. You know, so somebody asked, for example, what do I do if the materials that I need to use are more expensive than the more polluting materials? How do you deal with that? Um, so this is what this is trying to help you to address. Um, and then also to look at the sustainability issues on the impact to the economy, I mean, on society, so people, the economy, um, and the environment. So let's just talk through, and then again, there are a few resources. So in this yellow block at the top, there, quite, there are a couple of resources that you can go and look at that are just easy to go into. So maybe you're answering a question in the tool and it doesn't let you because you don't know enough and ask the question. You can go and look up some resources and try and um, educate yourselves in the process. Um, so we start with, do you have a current business or business idea? And I think everyone in the room here would answer yes. I have a business idea. Um, and the purpose for this was just really of this is to try and understand whether somebody is just starting out, wants to start a business, maybe it's a young person, can't find a job in the main workplace, wants to start a business. Um, and then that person would need help with thinking through, well, what kind of business? Most of you have business. In fact, all of you have businesses already, I'm sure at different stages of a business life cycle. So you would be answering, yes, you do have. Um, so now we're back at the portable toilets, um, which are toilet malls in areas where there's a lack of access to water and sanitation. So this is the toilet flush business that I was talking about earlier. So here is where you would just put in what your business is. Um, so in uh, Tandiwe's case, um, this would be um, 
the, the technologies that she's working with, which are um, rainwater harvesting and geysers and um, water saving plumbing. Um, and for Jabu, these would be recycling. Um, so looking at different materials um, and sourcing locally produce, produced goods. Um, and then he does repairs and, um, and maintenance. And so that's the briefly the description that would go in there. Um, and then the sector, in this case, this business was water supply and sanitation. Um, some of your plumbing, so you would also fall into that category, but you could otherwise be using a category, which I think we don't have in here, which we need to adjust, which is the installation repairs and maintenance. Um, but there are categories that are built in to the tool that you could choose. If, you're, if, the, if your business falls into a category that doesn't fall into one of the ones that are in the tool, you can select other and then write your sector in. So if our RM is not in there, you would put it here. Um, then we ask you to have a look at whether your business would contribute to any of the following and you select from the drop down menu. Let me just why this drop down is not working sometimes. Um, and I think it is because I'm screen sharing. Um, but there's a whole list of infrastructure here. So it's transport, roads, health, electricity, um, water, et cetera. Um, and if your business is going to contribute to any of those, like this business here for the toilets is water and sanitation, then you would choose those from the drop-down menu. Um, then we ask a question as to whether or not people have accessed funding for their business. Um, we do know that many SMEs haven't. They're either self-finance or they borrow money from family and friends or whatever it is they do, um, or, or just self-finance through ongoing project work, which is how One World did it. Um, we've never actually borrowed money for this business. Um, but if, you, if we'd had heavy infrastructure requirements like you know, buying equipment for solar, we might have. Um, and so just to, to have a look at that. Um, but for a financier, and this is why this is important. If you're trying to access finance for your business and you never have before, they're going to um, likely um, find it more difficult to lend to you because they'd worry about your track record. You know, do you have a proven track record in terms of being able to pay the money back? Um, so it's an important question for them. But colleagues, then we have a look at um, different resources. So we've looked at infrastructure. Now we're looking at different resources. So, and these are all resources, as was the case with the infrastructure, that are hugely important from an environmental green economy and climate change perspective. So um, water, we all know we can't do without, but what we're asking here, and Tandiwe, I'll come back to you for, again, for examples, just now as you, Cyril, um, as to how reliant is your business on water? So everybody needs it. Maybe you only need it for your employees to drink water through the day, and maybe you actually need it for your business um, operations or the equipment that you're installing in people's homes or businesses. Um, and it's a very simple rating of not reliant at all moderately reliant, which is where I would put the drinking water example, and very reliant is where I would put the toilet example. Um, if your business did not have access to water, could it continue to operate at 80% of capacity um, and still conduct your main activities? So this is now uh, taking that question of reliance on the water resource to another level. Um, the so is there a plan B? And if there isn't a plan B, like we would not have been able to run this training this morning if we hadn't had an alternate source of electricity and data. So, so in the end, we were using the generator, um, which was also misbehaving this morning, but we did have an alternate access to energy. Otherwise, we would not have been able to operate this training course. So that's a very good example. And, and also Wi-Fi. Um, when in the end, we used for some time our phone data, and um, so we had a plan B. If there isn't a plan B and you can't operate at 80%, that means you're losing enormous functionality um, because of the risk of climate change. Um, so it's an important thing to consider. It's one of the most important things to consider. 
Um, the same applies to electricity as it does to water. So I'm not going to repeat the questions. Um, I've already explained that. Um, we also ask how reliant your business is on access to energy. This is obviously an even more important question at the moment because of load shedding. Um, and so again, you know, 80% colleagues is the threshold. If you are only able to operate at 50%, you'd have significant uh, impacts on your revenue, significant impacts on your ability to service your clients, which also could have knock-on effects in the longer term um, for, for being able to stay in business because your clients are gonna go where to people that can provide. You know, if you want to go out, um, it's maybe a bad example, but if you want to go out and get a hamburger tonight and there's load shedding, you're not going to go get it at a place that hasn't got an alternative means of cooking. You're going to go somewhere else. So you'll go to the place that can give you the hamburger, um, even though there's load shedding. And this is the really critical thing in terms of competitive advantage and being able to continue to function. Um, we then look at business strength. Um, so Tindiwe and Cyril, just to prepare you, um, when I come to just giving examples just now, um, if you can choose um, one example from resource dependency, um, and then also I'm going to ask you to comment on business strength because these things go together. Um, very hard to borrow money if the financier doesn't think that you are um, fundable, in other words, that you'll pay back the money. Um, and then there are other factors. So we are looking at um, the triple bottom line, so people and um, the environment and um, economic aspects such as prosperity. Um, so one of the key questions is does or will your business employ other people? So colleagues, if we go to the African Development Bank credit facility I was talking about earlier, they want to see that maybe the business only employs one or two people in the beginning, but they want to see there'll be scale over time um, and that there's employment creation through this business, as an example. Would, you, would your business be able to improve um, agriculture practices or water management or energy management? And I'm using those because those are some of the examples of the business in the room. Um, and would your business improve the lives of people in society in some way? Um, will your business contribute to improved water efficiency or improved energy efficiency? Um, will it contribute to the physical development that's inclusive of people? So for example, maybe you're putting like this example, um, toilet systems in places that don't have them, um, you're improving um, the lives of people. Um, and, and their welfare, it could be in rural areas, it could be in um, urban areas, it could be both. Will you be contributing to waste and pollution, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as I said, I'm not able to go through all of this now, um, but these are the kinds of questions that we ask. And again, there's a scoring system. This particular business, which remember is the um, water supply and sanitation, so the portable toilet, what they call malls, in other words, a group of toilets for communities or schools or clinics to be able to access where there's a lack of access to water and sanitation. Um, so that was what this business is. And the scoring says that in this particular instance, they got 59. Um, so that's out of 100, right? It's a percentage. So they got 59%. And the threshold, as I said earlier, there's a threshold here, is that a score of 31% or higher in terms of how this tool works indicates strong alignment with sustainable development objectives um, because you are fulfilling or meeting at least five um, of the SDGs and you're covering um, the most basic and broadly um, applicable goals, which could be um, promoting inclusive growth, economic growth, and employment and decent work. Um, so that's SDG number eight. Um, and the reason that this is important, I'm sure many of you don't think about the SDGs, but some of your clients and um, suppliers and the people you supply to do. 
Um, so big businesses and financiers are all thinking about it. They have to. And there's been an enormous um, increase in the last two years, two to three years on this issue in businesses um, around the world. So First Rand, which is First National Bank and Rand Merchant Bank are less and less inclined to invest in businesses that are not safeguarding against these risks and are not doing something positive um, in the ESG space. We then go through a series of feasibility questions. So here we, the tool tries to look at whether or not your business idea can actually work. Remember I said earlier, we're looking at the sustainability contribution. We're also looking at the viability of the business. Can it actually work? Will you be able to pay back the money? Will you be able to make a long-term income stream out of this? Um, and so the questions here are things like, do you have um, the adequate or will you have adequate human infrastructure, financial, et cetera, resources, or can these be made available? Um, so let's say, for example, you want your source alternate building materials. Um, it's fine to say, yes, I want to do that because I want to align with environmental and sustainable development goals. But if those materials are not easily available, what are you going to do? Um, will you have a viable business? Um, can you find those materials? And if you can find them, will they be continuously available or are you going to have interruptions in supply? Um, of those materials. So Patrick, um, obviously food for thought for you because you're looking at alternate construction materials you mentioned earlier. Um, you're still thinking about what those are, but some of the questions you'll have to ask is, will I have reliability of supply? Are they going to fluctuate in prices to the extent that I can't manage or monitor um, the impact cost-wise cost on my business? Um, there are a number of different questions that come in here. Um, these are very simple yes, no, or I don't know um, questions or answers rather. Um, we look at suitability. Does your business idea make economic sense? Um, in other words, is there a market for your business? Um, will it be supported locally and nationally? Does it align with policy objectives? Um, and policies and plans. So that's suitability. And then uh, there's impact. Um, and under impact, we look at social impacts. Is this a gender inclusive business? Um, does it include the youth? Does it promote equality and reduce poverty? Um, will it bring about mitigation benefits, etc.? And again, here you get a score. Um, and in this case, the business score was 69%. Um, and that was before they went into a um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction assessment. Um, and their overall score was 45%, which means that they have a weak business case um, for climate financing overall. But they would have with their 69%, and you, if you're not a mitigation business, in other words, you're not reducing greenhouse gases, then they will have um, an average case for climate financing overall. So this is the stop go point. Um, because if you have got a weak case, you need to first go and strengthen your case before you go and apply for, for the money. Um, so let me pause there. Um, I wanted some examples from uh, resources. So let me just go back there, resource dependency. Um, the and Tandiwe, it sounded like water was a key resource for you. So I just wondered if you could give us an example on how reliant your business is on access to water or energy. Um, and if you can choose from column B, C, or D, so not reliant, moderately, or very. Um, and then Cyril, I'm going to ask you the same question on behalf of Jabu. Um, so Tandiwe, can I call on you again, please? Oh, yes. Okay, with water, okay. I think my business do have access to water. I don't know whether if you ask me in terms of operating or in terms of running the business. Um, Tandi, we're both. You know, what, in other words, if you didn't have access to water, um, would you be able, so let's go to question in row 20, um, or sorry, 20, 
Okay, well, let's use, oh, it's, it's question number seven, it's row number 17, sorry. I'm getting confused between energy and water. So if we go to row number 17, if you did not have access to water, would you be able to continue to operate at 80% of your capacity and still conduct your business as main activity? Okay. Now, honestly, no, I won't manage to operate because most of my business, because of I'm doing the raft foundations, it, that needs water to do the mixture, the more, the, the motor so I, I really need water so that's what I basically work with even if with even with the plumbing in order for you to be able to do the finishing off there are some certain places whereby you need to uh to be leveling up where you're going to be putting maybe probably let me just say uh concrete or or bricks so I think yeah it, it won't manage to operate at all okay. without water so, right. so in terms of yeah, sorry. normally on site we do have like maybe three or four Jojo tanks that are there just to store the water just for in case if we run out of water so i think with storing the water we are sorted we can manage to store the water in the Jojo tanks and then there was another one that says that uh would your business bring any impact into the community Yes. I think yes. I'm I'm still looking into making sure that I can maybe uh take some a few students from the colleges, uh, students that are doing the maintenance. I can maybe train them for plumbing. Uh, maybe some of them that are doing paint just for uh, for them to be able to get the experience. And I'm also looking forward to taking myself to uh being trained uh to have uh to be sit accredited so that i can manage also to be able to train them so yeah those are fantastic examples tendiwe um sorry i was just making a note um and i you know for a number of reasons because there's also a spin-off um impact that you're talking about with the jojo tank so basically yes. what tendiwe is saying colleagues is that her business can't function without water. And so what you've already done, it sounds like, Tandiwe, is make a plan B, um, yes. which is what Jojo Tank sounds like, because you know that you can't function without water. So you're using water, water storage facilities to deal with that. The spin-off is that it's great for the Jojo Tank suppliers because you're increasing the demand um, for oh, those. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I think there's a, a really important knock-on effect there. Um, in addition to um, your having um, adopted a, a rainwater harvesting solution to be able to deal with the water shortage issues that we that we face in the country. Um, so that's, those are some really great examples. And then what um, Tandiwe is also saying is that she could be training community members um, to basically do what you do, Tandiwe, is that right? Um, so yes, correct. Yeah, so that they can, and so you can also scale up your business. Um, so Tandiwe, I would think that your business here, I mean, we haven't run the exercise, um, but from what I'm hearing and what I've seen in the case study example um, the, that Cyril captured from you, is that there's a, there's a very strong um, case here for a green business um, that could access finance, could increase the reputation, um, and actually could have a competitive advantage. So Tandiwe, let me just come back to you for one last question on this particular screen. Um, have you experienced, just interested to know, have you experienced any competitive advantages with the way that you've addressed, um, for example, having Jojo tanks on site? I mean, do people know that you're giving them a better service because of that? Oh, yeah, I think yes, because even the most of the sites that I work on, they are Jojo tanks because it's always the alternative. Because most of the constructions, it happens that sometimes we run out of water. So that was uh, the only solution that we can come up with. Right. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you very much, Tandy. Where's Cyril? Can I go to you? Uh, sure, Belinda. I think. You know, while you were going through the questions, you know, uh, one of the earlier questions were, were you, would you be able to to operate uh, if you only had, say, 80% electricity capacity? And here again, I'm thinking about Jabu, you know, installing solar, uh, solar panels, solar systems. 
Um, and the reality is, you know, a lot of that would be drilling, right? Putting in the infrastructure, inverters, the panels themselves, um, and that would severely severely limit his his operations right if you have a traditional power drill that you plug with a lead into the wall uh however if you know somebody like jabu would invest in in power tools that have batteries uh on them that would allow him to kind of mitigate for for those type of of disruptions um then I was also thinking around the, the social aspects that we spoke, and this is specifically one of the things Jabu mentioned is, you know, in the future, he looks to, to expand his workshop uh, to get more space um, to, to work in, uh, but then also to provide training for, for younger scholars, uh, specifically in terms of electrical installations uh, and fixing, fixing appliances. Uh, so that was certainly one of the, the things he also identified that, that he wants to do going forward. Um, and so also thanks. Those are also great examples. I'm just going to ask if there are any um, uh, insights that you have from Jabu's business around some of the other aspects, such as, you know, just to demonstrate the holistic nature of this. Anything around feasibility? Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things he mentioned was you know, at, at the outset, he was just doing kind of installation of traditional uh, electrics, right? Uh, and, and he very early on realized that there is a demand for, for solar. Uh, so he actually went out and looked for opportunities to, to gain knowledge on, on solar installation, on the different types, on the different setups, um, to actually bring that into his, his business as well. And I think that really speaks to to his ability to grow a sustainable business as well, diversify, you know, different kind of services that that he can offer uh, to to really keep his business running, which which I think was a, a really great example in his in his case. No, I think it is a great example, and not least because diversification, you know, being able to have revenue streams from more than one place so that you don't have all your eggs in one basket is always such a great resilience, business resilience solution, right? And I think we can see that in both Tandiwe and Jabu's business cases. Exactly, yeah. Excellent. Um, all right, colleagues, I'm, I'm drawing a lot on Jabu and um, Tandiwe because we did case studies with them um, just so that we could have some practical material to demonstrate with you today, but um, let me just pause and see if there's anyone else that would like to comment from their business perspective um, or ask questions. And so I can, before we go on to the next part of the tool, I can just give others an opportunity to ask questions or comment. I'm not seeing anything and I don't see anything in the chat. Um, and colleagues also just to say that the, the link to the toolkit has been downloaded in the chat, you can use it um, and access it. And also to say that um, there is a, we did turn this into an application. So there is an app for the tool, you know, otherwise we would have been behind the times. Um, it um, was not working last week when I wanted to send it to Abigail, um, but I think it's been fixed today. So we'll send that to all of you as well. So you can actually uh, use it on your phone or whatever. Um, Vanessa, all right. just, yes, Cyril. Sorry, I just quickly saw uh, Vanessa, I think, was it that raised her hand? I don't know if oh, she wanted yeah, to that's... add something. Vanessa, please do go ahead if you wish. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Um... Unfortunately, I was disturbed with load shedding, so I couldn't uh, capture most of your the, your points. Eh? However, while we are still asking um, uh, Tandiwe, and that we have competitive, uh, if his if her business have competitive advantage over others, I was trying to reflect on my own business. Eh? Currently, I was working at uh, at at one of uh, areas where there was no electricity. Actually, there is no electricity. Electricity has just been, um, we are trying to do electricity. So in that area, I couldn't work 
was like uh, 80% I needed electricity eh, to to drill the uh, the, the to, to, just to 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 make, to to use generator so in essence um when i'm going through uh, this um tool it looked like each and every business each and every business need this uh, uh, tool just to weigh ourselves if how are we are we are we going forth with the challenges eh? like your water your electricity because sometimes it's things that we take it for granted eh? but it really shows that we really need to tap in this uh, a green economy because most of the things affect us but we're not aware of that uh, it, 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 it can play on the green uh, economy space thank you Sorry, I was talking on mute. Vanessa, while I've got you, um, won't you just tell us quickly what your business is about so that we've got some context to your comments and thanks very much. Those were helpful comments. Thank you. Uh, my business is a general building and I, I've done um, a civil as well. And on one instance, I've built prefabricated classrooms. Um, prefabricated classrooms, it was one of brand water when they were doing CSI's project. Eh? So um, it was one of um, one of the, the township where the, there was a, a nursery school, but they didn't have, they only have land. Eh? So the infrastructure was not good because in that uh, wall, there was some rodent that was coming through. So one of the projects that I've done and that I wish to do going forward is prefabricated uh, classrooms. Uh, taking in, uh, in essence, what's going in, in KwaZulu Natal, you know, where there's flooding. If such thing of prefabricated material, because it's a very strong material and, um, it, and it is a very good strong material that will save uh, uh, um, the environment because we don't use your normal mortar and water, you know. You just put the classroom there and it becomes strong. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's strong, you know. Even though in the coastal we can have a problem of rusting, but that can be, be, be that can be uh, addressed to say if you are doing a prefabricated uh, classroom or a house. Because really now I think there's a crisis for housing and all. So prefabricated material for classroom and and housing, uh, it, it it can be a solution, you know. Even though we know in, in, in it's humid, so all those uh, aluminium material can be used in in in, in KwaZulu Natal, of which is one of the things that I have already done, and I'm currently again doing roofing at uh, one of uh, the houses in Joburg and in uh, RDP houses. In RDP houses, I'm putting a roofing and your normal uh, um, a plumbing. You know, when I say normal, because this is the normal things, this is the specific standard. But after, after hearing, listening to you, there are so much that it can be done. Uh, for instance, uh, your RDP house, it's a 40 square meter house and they put roof on it. They put ceiling. Whenever there's load shedding, I mean, in areas where there's electricity, they become doom. But if they can take some square meters, like uh, like three meters, and they change the whole roofing, you know, they put something like um, uh, not your 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 you, you know those uh, uh, material that is very it's poly polyethylene kind of material. They don't use your normal roofing because in that in in so doing they can be able to have light. They cannot rely on electricity only. So and unfortunately, or not unfortunately, maybe with time, they will be able to change the spec. And with us attending such courses, and if we can remember, we are working there, we know uh, the, 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 the challenges, even though they have spec that was done uh, 20 years ago, but with for us to be able to go in a green economy, we really need to change how we do things and even the spec. As I'm sitting right now, I'm sitting in my house and there's a sun that is coming through. I didn't light electricity. So if we can be able to use and utilize such things, it can we can build a better a green economy. Thank you.
Uh, Vanessa, you've been wonderful. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that's helpful for our colleagues to hear your examples and your enthusiasm. So, um, and uh, I mean, the prefab classrooms, I think it's a fantastic um, solution for a whole lot of um, situations and you know partly the climate change but also the point that i was making earlier vanessa about being able to build back faster um because it's a much less lengthy process yeah so some excellent examples and thoughts there thank you thank you very much and i agree with you about the rdp housing um and one of the things just want to encourage or any of you vanessa and others that are working in um materials or construction that deal with people's living conditions um, to also please um, ask that you look at insulation, you know, so that people, you also want to reduce, and this is where I think you, I was scrolling down for this, you could have an impact on um, improving the lives of people in rural areas or safety or et cetera, and this list of things here. If people can have housing, access to housing or housing or access to schools that don't need as much heating, it means you're reducing the costs of living for them because our research has shown that people can't afford to pay for the electricity or the energy services to keep their homes warm um, and really suffer in winter. Um, or their costs go up very high in winter and something else gives way. So that's another way of thinking about how you can improve the livelihoods of people and have an impact on your on society um, in, in like, for example, row 43 would be to use materials that can reduce costs um, and improve you know, the well-being of people. Um, so thanks, thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, Sorola, am I missing anybody else? Or shall I continue? Uh, no, I think you can continue. Thanks, Glenda. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. All right. So colleagues, um, once you've done this step in the tool, you would go um, next. So we go to the climate impact assessment. Again, I'll just quickly make this bigger. Um, the You saw this first to fourth order impact assessment model in the training in the actual presentation I did this morning. Um, but here what we've done is built it into the tool so that you, and you've heard some of this already, right, from Tundiwe and Vanessa and others, so that you can actually think through how climate change um, impacts, how those impacts actually impact your business. So maybe you didn't know enough in the first parts of the questions, this will help you to understand in more detail how climate change like a flood or a rise in temperature may actually impact on the environment you work in or on your operations. So Tandiwe asked me, for example, to qualify earlier, am I talking about running your business or actually providing operational services? It, it's both colleagues. It's, it's all the way through um, the, the life cycle and the process of doing business. But if you can't access your premises that you work in, um, because there's a flood, you can't probably um, produce the services unless you've got a plan B. So it's always about what do you put in place? Like Tindiwe put Jojo tanks in place because she knows that she can't function without water. Um, we've put a generator in place because we know we can't function without electricity and we can't afford those kinds of interruptions. So it's that kind of thinking, but through in, in a bit more detail than what we've done before. Um, so again, it's, it's a very interactive part of the tool. Um, so the diagram is on the left hand side, just as an example. So you could be dealing with temperature or rainfall, and you would choose. Um, so you fill in the table based on what um, your answers to are, are you dealing with increased temperature? Is that an issue for you? We've been through some examples of this. Um, Tandiwe said that increased rainfall, so flooding, is an issue for her. Um, Cyril said that increased temperature is an issue for Jabu's business. Um, so you would choose accordingly. Um, and then you would again choose um, the second order impact. So maybe you've got increased evaporation or an increase in the number of hot days and nights, which increase heat stress. Um, you could choose more than one of these. You might have increased water scarcity, which Tandi Tandiwe is obviously facing, um, and increased flooding. 
which many of us have been facing. So you might choose um, more than one of those um, and that would then go into the table. Um, then we ask you to think through um, what, how would that impact the ecosystem and the environment that you are functioning in? How would it impact your production potential or your daily business operations? So colleagues, this is exactly the kind of questions I've been asking you, you know, can you function? Um, at 80% of your capacity if you don't have water, et cetera, or if there's a drought. So it's, the, it's exactly those kinds of questions. But here you would actually be required to think it through and make a note of um, how uh, these climate Im impacts would impact on your business. So to go back to the portable toilet mall example that this um, part of the tool is, is built off, um, is that they said the draft will lead to less water available, availability um, to be able to use in the portable toilets and it would disrupt the service to the community that they're providing. So that would mean that in a drought, and this they have to pay attention to in the same way that Tandiwe has paid attention to lack of water, she's put Jojo tanks in place. Using this tool made these people realize with the portable toilets is that it's all very good and well to provide toilets to communities they need it and that's a you know it can be a service they pay for but if you stop providing those toilets because there's no water availability that means the community now suddenly doesn't have toilets anymore and you're losing your income as a business um, plus they said that in addition to that floods would be an issue because they could um, displace the toilets you know so that the toilets would need to be flood resilient um, and to be able to continue to operate um, in and around the flood. And colleagues, we, we saw, I know I keep bringing up KZN, but obviously I'm going to because it's such a, such a, a difficult example of what um, people experience and businesses experience and even large businesses who one would think have got the resources to sort of come back, have struggled to come back um, and, and to resume operations quickly. Um, so these things are, are really important um, to think about. Um, and then at a fourth order level, in other words, what I was saying earlier, you know, where the rubber hits the road, um, is how these impacts would affect social and economic conditions. And I've mentioned some examples. So if these toilets are there to provide clean sanitation, to improve community health, but there's a flood event um, or there's no water, to make the toilets functional, you could absolutely turn that benefit around in the wrong way. Um, uh, plus the business might lose jobs because of not being able to operate at full capacity and because of losing re revenue. So the bottom table then summarizes um, all of these impacts. And this is a great, um, to go back to, you know, Chimani, your question, I think it was earlier around how do you convince? This is a very good way of convincing. Um, when you're able to actually logically articulate um, the impacts and why, as Vanessa was telling us so articulately just now, why going the green economy route and taking advantage of the fact that it's there um, or coming to be there um, is important. This is a great way of articulating those arguments. It's simple, it helps you think it through logically you might have to write it up a little bit more beautifully afterwards, but even having that table and the diagram on the left populated is part of your, your business case. And, and that's that's the beauty of it. Um, and that business case, Chimani being your means of convincing. Um, so I'm really, as you can hear, so pleased that you asked that question. Um, all right, so let me just pause and see if there are any comments or questions. Um, I won't pick on anybody this time, but just if any of you want to comment, Cyril, maybe you want to, or Tundiwe, or anybody, Vanessa, otherwise I'll continue to the next. And maybe Chimani, you can comment on whether or not you think this might be useful way of convincing that this is the route to go. So your question specifically was, I think you had two, you know, one is how do you convince the others? How do you deal with the fact that some materials are more expensive, which was also part of convincing. Um, is this helpful in any way? Are there any more thoughts that you have in that regard? Anybody that wishes to speak may raise their hands or unmute their mics. I've got no takers. 
right, so I will continue because we will have another opportunity. Um, so again, you can go to the next step, which is the business um, risk and opportunity assessment tool. And this is basically where things get pulled together. Um, so let me just make it slightly bigger. Um, for new businesses, this, this part of the tool is really great for helping you consider and plan for potential climate risks so that you can avoid those at the get-go. Um, and for existing businesses, it's to help you plan for climate risks um, that you're already facing, like Tandiwe is, um, with water scarcity, um, both now and in the future, by considering the impacts on different parts of your business. Um, so colleagues, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it in great detail, um, but I just want to say that um, there are examples. So let's focus here on building design and infrastructure, because that's pretty much what we're dealing with in terms of businesses here. There are resources in the tool, um, but basically for building design and infrastructure, the likely impacts include extreme weather events, as we have said repeatedly, such as floods, which can disrupt transport routes or your site work, like Tindiwe was saying, or site deliveries, um, and thus it could restrict your number of working days. That's my 80% capacity question. Um, then you can have extreme on top of that weather events that can damage your infrastructure, um, like the toilet example, um, that you then have to fix that infrastructure before you can continue working. Um, excessive heat, I've spoken about in terms of reduced worker productivity. Um, and then there's this question of design standards that will be imposed increasingly, and they are, um, to safeguard buildings and infrastructure. And that's because the insurance industry will drive this to some extent, as will others. Um, but health and safety people, people that have to pay for the rebuilding, all of these people are going to drive these issues. Um, and these design standards, because they're trying to either reduce their costs, if you're an insurance company, or improve the health and safety of, of people, if you're in the health and safety industry, or if you're in a business that has to comply with health and safety standards. So there are a lot of drivers here, colleagues, and again, you know, I'm reluctant to overwhelm you. Um, with too many examples, but I think from what I was hearing from the discussion earlier um, that people are, are, are understanding um, the point, and if you don't, then please do say, and we'll try and address it in the time that we have left with us today. Um, so here, colleagues, we're looking at the business motive. Um, so some of you have already mentioned this. Um, so for example, reducing reliance on on energy because it isn't always there or because you want to save costs. As somebody said um, in the chat room earlier when we were asking the question of, you know, how are you thinking about these issues? Um, you, one of you said you want to reduce costs for your clients um, through increased energy efficiency. Um, so these are just some examples of, of what you could be doing to do that. So you could increase energy efficiency through different technologies or lower consumption um, operations. Um, and, and so that's re refitting equipment, et cetera. Um, you could also be shifting operational energy usage towards renewable energy sources um, that cost less because you're using the sun and not buying from Eskom, for example. So always that upfront capital cost, but over time, you would, you would probably be able to pay it back, but that's something you would need to examine, as I said earlier, from a financial forecasting perspective. You could be um, complying with different um, climate regulations as these emerge and consumer pressure so that you can remain competitive, sustainable, and have a good reputation in the marketplace. And that could mean that you develop new climate friendly products and services. And Patrick, I think that's what you were saying in the breakout group earlier that you're looking at alternate materials. Um, I know you haven't got there yet in terms of what they are, but you're thinking about it and you would then um, both be complying and possibly also think and being competitive and possibly also thinking maybe about more cost effective. Um, materials. And Vanessa's example of um, prefabricated materials for classrooms as opposed to bricks and mortar is a very good example of, of potentially more climate friendly products and services. Um, so there are a range of um, examples here. 
Um, another area that you could fit into is to reduce future unexpected costs due to climate change. So refitting facilities or renewing them to make them more resistant to extreme weather events. Vanessa would definitely want to make sure that her classrooms, her prefab classrooms are flood resilient, for example, or heat resilient. Um, you would maybe think about purchasing insurance against extreme weather risks, um, but that's an additional cost for yourself, but it might be worthwhile um, so that you've got some means of recouping losses. Um, just as if you had a burglary um, and you wanted to replace um, what was stolen and you had insurance that would help you do that. Um, so it's a risk-based mechanism because that burglary might never happen or the flood might never happen, but you've got that insurance that um, can help mitigate. You could also be looking, um, we talked about relocating towns or settlements earlier, you could also be looking at relocating your operations to areas that are less prone to extreme weather events. It may be cheaper than taking out long-term insurance. So these are all the different things, colleagues, um, that you would need to evaluate. So what this part of the tool does um, is it asks you to populate a risk matrix. Um, and in the case of the toilets that I was talking about, the toilet malls, um, one of the risks they identified so, um, was in price. Um, so they said that they would have increased price of water, it would impact their business because of water scarcity will drive up water prices. Um, that hasn't happened yet, um, but it's likely to. Um, there's always supply and demand issues. Um, you could be, sorry, I'm on the wrong side of the tool here. You can't see what I can see. Um, and then the they physical risks they said were higher as the toilets may be washed away during flooding. I mentioned that earlier. Um, the uncertainties of that, because you don't know if a flood or when a flood's going to occur, and then it can be quite sudden when it does happen. So maybe you do get an early warning from the municipality um, or weather services to say there's a flood coming, but is that early warning coming in enough time for you to be able to do something? And what is it you would do? So these are the things to, to think about. Um, they thought about mitigation actions. So that's what the risk matrix does. It asks you to think about what actions you could take to prevent or reduce the impact. Um, and they said that more research would be needed to um, just assess flood protection mechanisms and flood forecasting so that they could then find locations. So that goes back to the point of maybe moving your operation um, to a place that's less um, flood impacted um, and that these could be very effective mechanisms because now you're not having to take out insurance. Your insurance is that you moved into a place that's not as flat um, at, at flood risk, um, as, as an example. Um, we also asked the question of, are there any possible opportunities for your business arising from this impact? Um, it's the thing in life, right? Is that wherever there's a threat, um, there's an opportunity. Wherever there's a weakness, there's a strength. So that's the same philosophy that's being applied here for want of a better, a better phrase. Um, but important to think about the opportunities. And then colleagues, that's why when um, Tandiwe was giving the example of um, rainwater harvesting tanks, Jojo tanks, as we fondly know them and Jojo's brand, um, it's, um, it's a, uh, an opportunity, maybe not for Tandiwe unless she decides to manufacture, rainwater harvesting tanks, but it's certainly an opportunity for another business that's coming out of this. Um, so to always just be thinking about the opportunities, including for yourselves, because you could be expanding or changing your business um, so that you could either address the risks or take advantage of the opportunities or both. Um, so very important just to think about identifying those. Um, and there are some examples there. And we take people through these questions in terms of physical risk, price, as I said earlier, um, products. So there might be products that are unpopular because they're too expensive or because people see them as unsustainable. Um, like I think air conditioning is unsustainable um, because it uses so much electricity, um, for example. Um, 
there are a range of examples here. So, and then there's reputation risk um, or opportunity, as some of you have identified, and there's regulation risk. Um, so that's government action that's prompted by climate change, which could impact you. In other words, government might say, you know, your local government say, might say in the East of Cape, well, there's a water crisis, we're going to introduce water shedding, or we're going to introduce um, water, um, I've forgotten the term, um, sanctions, so uh, or penalties, um, and you can't use water, particularly, you know, during these hours, or you can only use 50 litres of water per day per person in your household, so restrictions. There are various mechanisms that government have got, um, the, they've got the facility to use and they can deploy them very quickly, um, like water restrictions, as we saw during the Cape Town drought or water shedding, as we've seen in the Eastern Cape at the moment. Um, and these may affect you. Um, and, you know, how quickly can you go and put a Jojo tank in place is the kind of question you would need to ask. So colleagues, that's the, the risk matrix part of the assessment and it's where I'm going to stop. Um, with the tool today, um, it does, um, after you've filled in the matrix, um, you then go through the step of considering the likelihood of each of those risks that you've identified taking place, um, and you fill, in a, you fill in a ranking there, um, and that then also gives you a score and some assumptions. Um, I know I'm going through this very quickly, um, but again, to go back to Chimani's question earlier, what filling this in does is give you an output that is an argument or a rationale as to why your business makes sense in the green economy. That's what it does. Um, so it is useful to fill out either because you want to raise finance or because you want to turn this into marketing material. I know some of you use brochures to market yourselves. You could be turning this the outcomes of this intro brochure that goes and tells your client base and the market that you're offering something in the green economy that manages the risk of water insecurity or energy insecurity or contributes to a more sustainable environment or contributes to in, uh, community well-being. <clears throat> so it's again a tool to convince um, and to document in, in one place. Um, the yeah you know the rationale for why your business fits so well within the green economy how you could scale it up and also help you to raise financing um, so colleagues i will stop there and um, the tool is available to you on the link um, and we will also send out the app um, link to through nbi um, to you i just want to end by saying um, as far as the tools con concerned and before I open up for last questions or comments before we go to the last module, I just want to end by saying that um, this tool on average we've learned and we've piloted across probably about 70 different SMEs um, and across six countries, it on average takes about two hours. To complete it, um, so it does take a bit of time, you can break it up um, or do it over a weekend, but it does take a bit of time, but I'm hoping that it is of, of use to you um, as a means for growing your businesses and improving <coughs> your offering in the green economy space. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and just ask Hillary to share the slides again. Well, I can, I suppose, share the slides, but while we're doing that, just see if there are any um, last comments or questions on that part of the training. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mengel here. Yes, uh, there were some there were some links which you are sharing on your on your slides, and uh, you, you just went through them, and I wanted to copy <coughs> some of the of, of the links. How can we do that? Can we send it? Oh, we can we can send it. We'll we'll distribute um, through NBI. We'll distribute the presentation and the tool. So everything you've seen that you've wanted to copy, you'll have. Does that work for you? Okay. okay no, it's fine. Thanks. Thanks, Lily. Really. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Also to add, Mingle, um, in the chat feature on Zoom, you'll find scroll up a little bit. Um, there's a link there to. 
um, a, the, the Excel tool and you can actually download it there and then you can click on the links once you've inside the document once you've downloaded it. Thanks, Hilary. Um, but I think we will also, in addition, just email everything out to everyone together so it's in one place. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. Thanks, Nick. Um, all right, so colleagues, we'll go to the, the last module. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm back to racing through the material. Um, so I think what I'll do is focus on, on key aspects. Um, there's not anything really new that we haven't discussed already that's coming in the last part of the presentation, but just really trying to pull everything together um, and to really focus on opportunities for implementing sustainable solutions. And I think we've seen many of these opportunities, um, both from the materials that we've used today, but also from our colleagues um, that are in the room with us that have been generous in sharing um, their business ideas and experiences um, and I you know, really obviously encourage you to do more of that. It's always helpful to learn from each other. So let's have a look at what these opportunities are. If we can go to the next slide, <coughs> please. Um, there's some very nice um, documents that, that are also on the internet. So this particular um, expert is called Asato. Um, who's been doing quite a lot of research on how to implement green practices and trying to keep it simple, um, which is what we liked about it. Um, so he's looking at four key strategies and um, these four key strategies, which I'll unpack um, as we go through this a little bit, um, can work you know, together, but they can also function independently of each other. Um, but you could be thinking about your businesses in terms of one of these or two or three or four of these core, core th four core key strategies or four core strategies. Um, and there are strategies that look either at reducing costs. Um, so for example, strategy one, which is eco-efficiency, which is doing more with less. So maybe doing more of your operations and services with less energy or less water um, would be a very good green industrialization route to go. Um, so that would be reduced cost um, and or it could be a strategy that you adopt because you're trying to differentiate yourself from others in the market and giving yourselves a competitive advantage. So let's just talk those through. Um, strategy one, eco-efficiency, as I said, that's doing more with less. There are a couple of examples. We'll go through this just now. The second one um, is beyond compliance. I always smile when I see this because, um, and with happiness, because when we started One World, which was 20 years ago in 2001, um, one of the things we, because at that stage, sustainable development, climate change, were not on everybody's lips. That's why I was saying earlier that people thought that I was completely mad. Um, we also realized quite quickly, and this is a great example of beyond compliance, we realized quite, quite quickly that people then quickly thought, oh, they, they're doing work in environmental impact assessments, um, because that was something they understood. Um, but we weren't doing that. And we saw environmental impact assessments as being very important instruments, but very compliant based instruments. And our byline was beyond compliance. So we were one world sustainable investments slash beyond compliance. Um, so we were trying to work with clients um, in public and private sector to go beyond what the law said um, at that stage, which was very low um, and to stretch and do more. Um, strategy number three is eco branding, which is really about your um, how you brand yourselves with what I was asking um, Tindiwe and Vanessa earlier, I think it was Tindiwe I actually asked the question around, do your clients know um, that you are, are, are more sustainable? That's what we would, and if she went around and put a pamphlet out there or put a, a, a plaque or a sign up at her sites or construction sites, um, that would to say that you know, we are water wise, um, could be something that you could put up there if you don't already, Tundi, where that would be a, a means of eco-branding and it's a strategy for actually getting the message out to the market that you're actually paying attention to these issues. 
And then the fourth strategy is environmental cost leaders. I would think that all four of these together is about being an environmental cost leader, um, but it's about offering distinguished products and services um, into, into the market. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so I'll unpack these briefly. Um, Eco-efficiency, doing more with less is a great starting point for SMEs. Um, and it's a great point for you to start, partly because it's just easier way of entering into the green economy space, and partly because it's always helpful to reduce your own costs of doing business. Um, so it's a, it really is a good starting point for a number of reasons. Um, so you could be reducing your costs while improving the environmental performance of your operations. Um, you could be complying with the regulations and industry um, standards, um, but without really changing your products, but just showing how you comply and actually measuring um, against those standards and, and, being, and doing that in a way that's credible, you know, that people believe you. Um, the... And then the last one is to find the least disruptive strategy. We all know at the moment what disruption does, for example, from energy. Um, but really what this is saying is that you want to focus on a strategy that isn't going to disrupt your operations to the extent that it's uncomfortable, either for you as a business operation or for your clients. So there will be discomfort and change, there always is but you want to ease that discomfort so that it's not a big shock to the system and people run away and go, I'm going somewhere else for this service. So very important just to think about that. Let's go to the next slide, um, please. Beyond compliance, I've spoken about already, but it can also be around differentiating yourselves in your operations. Um, you know, Tindy, where's put Jojo tanks up? Many may not have. They might just say, sorry, we can't work today, there's no water. Um, so that's a differentiator and quite a simple one, but maybe it, it probably cost only where some money to put into that. Um, so it may require investment in those technologies like the rain also harvesting tanks, um, and also in adopting new and more efficient practices. So we all, I mean, we all have been around the block. We're not children, any of us anymore. We know that change comes at a cost, um, but we also know that that cost can bring enormous benefits. Um, so it really is colleagues about choosing the most cost effective and the most time and, you know, emotionally less, um, least disruptive option um, to get to where you need to be. Um, and making sure that if there are benefits for your customer, that your customer knows about them. Um, you can't just expect the customer to guess. They might be even more ignorant than you are about some things, or they might see the world differently, um, or they might just not be thinking about it. So you do want to use this as an opportunity to find ways of um, telling your customer that you're a cleaner, greener supplier, that they're benefiting from it, and how they are benefiting from that is important. Next slide, please. So the third strategy I spoke about is eco-branding. Um, this does require that you work within your product life cycle um, and, that you're, um, and that you do that across the different stages of design and manufacturing or the consumption. Um, I always think about plastics in this regard because people always think that, you know, my husband keeps telling me I must stop buying bottled water because I'm just using plastic. Um, and I think that if you recycle it or reuse those bottles, then, you know, what seems to be the problem, there's a whole industry behind this. Um, and you want to look at the entire life cycle of that plastic and finding ways of finding solutions. So what's the alternative? Um, is it bottled water? Is it water at a fountain? Um, et cetera. So you want to look across that um, chain. Um, and it does require strong marketing capabilities. So I keep saying, you know, if you're doing something good, tell your clients. If it means putting this into a brochure, do that. But of course, that comes at a little bit of a cost. And it can take time that you don't always have. I doubt that many of you have got marketing departments. We certainly don't. Um, it means we have to do it. Um, and so you always want to think again about the costs and benefits, right? Is it cost effective? Am I going to get a return from putting this brochure out or putting that water wire sign up at my construction site? And sometimes you need to just experiment a little bit. 
Um, and then green accreditation, which is about um, complying with standards and applying for accreditation. It's another process that can be time consuming, but very beneficial um, and strongly recommended for building standards, etc., and green building standards. I mean, these are all coming into existence to have a look into those and to try to um, yeah, address them and use those standards as an eco branding and a marketing tool. So again, you know, not just looking at the accreditation process, oh gosh, now I've got to comply with a set of standards and this is another painful thing to do, but rather to think about it from the perspective of once I've shown that I comply with these standards, I've got a, a sticker or a certificate that I can put on my product or my construction site or my office door, or my website that says that I comply with these standards, I'm a green building company and I might get more clients as a, as a result because many are looking for that in the market. Um, colleagues, just to say as Hillary is going to the next slide, that I do see the question, the great question in the chat and I will come back to it just now. Um, and then the last strategy colleagues is their environmental cost leadership. Um, which, you know, I think this for me combines a whole range of the, the strategies actually that we've talked about um, already. Um, and the environmental cost leadership is about looking across the value chain so that you're looking at sourcing, production and distribution to be more sustainable. Um, and it might be for some of you that are playing in one space of a value chain so maybe your plumbing service which some of you are and there's a shopping mall or a housing complex going up that a big constructor is putting up you're a part of that value chain in the construction industry because you'll maybe when a tender will be called upon to install the plumbing solution um, but the constructor of the overall shopping mall or could be a hospital whatever it is might want green toilets um, or um, green materials. Um, and they want to show that the overall construction site and building and product is gonna be more sustainable. You would be required to plug into um, all of that. And that might require some input standards. Um, and from the constructor's perspective, they may be choosing the plumber um, or the materials supplier um, against sustainability criteria. So it's really is about thinking where you fit in that overall value chain in your industry and what's happening in your industry. It's really important to understand that. You know, if you're working for one of the big construction companies and you typically get contracts from them, um, what are they doing? Where are they going in this space? Who's lending the money? Um, are those investors going to continue to lend the money if they don't comply with these standards? Is there anything you could be doing to position the business so that um, a, a, a more green economy or circular economy approach is taken? Um, next slide, please. So just some examples of application. If we can go to the next slide. Um, the and I'll end with a circular approach. Um, very important to, you know, just in terms of translating what we've been talking about now to look at um, adopting circular product cycles. So if you're, you know, I let's use your example, Vanessa, I don't know a lot about um, prefabricated materials, but I do know they're strong and I do know they can be quicker to erect um, and they're becoming cheaper options often. Um, but what you would want to be doing in that example, if you really want to promote a more sustainable business, Vanessa is to adopt a circular product life cycle approach, which means zero or low waste, um, you know, reusing materials where you can, fixing things instead of throwing them away and using the most sustainable materials that you can. So that's one really good example. Um, and, and with that, you know, with what I've said, looking at you know, reduced materials, reduced input costs, reduced water usage, reduced energy inputs, and then also reusing and recycling. Um, and then a big aspect of the circular economy, which I also, uh, I really enjoy, um, is to think local. You know, what of your materials can you source locally? Um, and how, to what extent can we keep a circular economy circular? So in other words, we're getting 
the materials from close by instead of from shipping them from somewhere and, and increasing emissions costs in shipping. Um, this way you could be thinking of reducing global emissions by sourcing your materials locally because transport is such a massive cost. Um, and if we can just go to the last slide, after which I'll try and respond to the question in the chat, and then we'll open up for some last comments and thoughts. Um, so what is a circular approach and what is the circular economy? Um, I heard um, Marguerite talking about it a bit in our breakout group earlier, and it's a concept we've mentioned a couple of times today. Um, but from a business model perspective, and I've tried to highlight that in my previous slide, a circular economy business model keeps products and material in use for as long as possible um, to get the maximum value out of it. So if you go back to the strategy slide, those four strategies, you'll remember um, do more with less. Um, that's part of what this is about, right? Is, um, is that you're using the same materials for longer or using the same amount of energy to do more of, and you're getting maximum value in that way. Um, so this approach is really important in, in terms of ensuring that materials are retained within the productive use life cycle in a, a high value state as possible. Um, so to go back to my plastics example, and this way plastics is, you know, are a big issue, is that people like I used to think you can recycle plastic. You can, um, but it deteriorates rapidly. So if a water bottle has been left lying on a beach, for example, for more than four days, it's deteriorated to a point that you can't recycle it. Um, so it then really does seriously become plastic waste. So the, I mean, obviously this whole um, circular economy and, and zero or low waste is a, a big topic and we haven't got time for that today. Um, but the objective, and that's the most important thing that we can try and get into, into all of your minds today, is to keep those materials in, in a high value state. So what that means for you, if you're a Vanessa <clears throat> and you're producing um, prefabricated classrooms and you do want to use materials from, I don't know, classrooms that have been washed away in a flood, but maybe there's still some materials you can salvage, or maybe there's a site that's been demolished and moved. And um, there's a place in Carolina and in Pumalanga um, where we've strongly suggested they move the classrooms because they're situated right next to a mine that blasts every hour and the kids cannot hear themselves think. It's a terrible way of getting an education and concentrating. And um, there'll be materials that they can salvage. But what you then want to understand in that example, and if you're a Vanessa, is how long does it take for that material to deteriorate to a point that you can't use it anymore? Um, you know, does it rot? Does it lose certain properties? So you want to understand your own product life cycle. You don't need to go and understand the whole world's waste. Um, so colleagues, with that, I'm gonna end. We've gone back to a, a bit of a high level. Um, so I think probably a good time to me to go to the question that's in the chat from the Kotla. Um, and then we'll open up for a few minutes. I know we're over time, so we're now two minutes over time. So if people have to go, we completely understand. Um, but I'll beg you for another few minutes. Um, so Lakot is saying that his interest in the, um, in the construction area is in solar energy because of load shedding, um, which is a daily issue. Um, and then also looking at taking solar energy to rural areas and looking for advice on how to access solar installation training. Um, so, yeah, I mean, somebody said maybe Abigail and the colleagues from NBI can help. Um, there are various places that you can go. Some of the TVET colleges have started adopting um, or, or implementing training. Um, there's the S South African National Energy Research Institute that offers training and also some of the um, uh, private sector manufacturers of solar equipment offer brilliant training. I've been on some of those training courses. They're, they're some of the best you can get because they really understand the product and they want to get their product out to market. Um, so there are also those training options. Um, but I think between ourselves and Abigail, we can put a list together for you um, and send that to you via NBI. Um, after today, along with the other materials that you've asked for. All right, 
So colleagues and Cyril, I think to give people a break from my voice um, and my voice a break from itself, I'm gonna ask you to facilitate a last round of discussion. Um, and if there are any questions that I, I can answer, of course I'm here. Uh, great, thanks, thanks Belinda. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a, a really fascinating session. And as you pointed out, um, just if there's any other questions from colleagues, uh, happy to to take a, a quick last round of, of questions or comments. Um, otherwise, I'll also just check in with Abigail from, from the NBI if there's anything she wanted to add. Um, so yeah, uh, happy for, for colleagues just to uh, either raise their hands or just to, to jump in if they have a last question or a comment. Good afternoon. <coughs> Dear Mingle here. Hi Mingle, go Hello. ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril and Belinda for this session and we've gained a lot. Um, thank you for, 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 for teaching us most of the things we didn't know. Thank you very much. Ah, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks, thanks for the compliment and the feedback. That's that's appreciated. Um, on that note, uh, I must also just add before we close out the session, um, my colleague um, Hillary, uh, she has a evaluation form that she'll uh, add to the the chat box. So if colleagues can just complete that for us, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, but we'll also, along with the other documents from the NBI, we'll, we'll circulate that as well. Um, and then I see Belinda's hand is, is raised as well. Thanks, Cyril. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I can see there are no more questions and I'm sure colleagues A need to go and B are exhausted <laughs> after a very long session. And so I just want to say thanks to all of you. You've been an amazing group to work with. Um, really, really amazing. And I'm not just saying that. Um, so thank you so much for participating today. I've learned a lot from you. And um, when they said you'd learned a lot from her, so I hope that's the case. And also to say thank you to MBI for making this opportunity available, both to us at One World, but I think mainly to all of you. And on Abigail, I mean, on that note, Abigail, I'm going to hand over to you to close us off. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Um, yeah, and I have to agree with you, uh, Cyril. It was really an awesome session, very eye-opening, and uh, it certainly got me thinking about a number of things that we could be um, looking at um, as uh, future interventions or even current interventions on how we assist um, businesses in repositioning and also just <clears throat> even to the extent of pivoting some aspects of their business. Uh, to take advantage of the opportunities, but also protect uh, businesses, uh, their businesses from what is really unavoidable uh, to all of us. So thank you very, very much for the session. Thanks to everyone who attended. And Lakhotla, uh, yes, please feel free to engage. And we are really keen to get a better understanding also from yourselves of um, you know, what other information would you like to know regarding the green economy? What other training sessions would you be interested in? And would certainly be taking that all in. Um, as I've previously mentioned, we are really looking at double clicking on that lens uh, uh, on the green economy because it overlays on all the sectors that we are working with. Um, and it is a topic that we, we, we cannot ignore. So we are really looking forward to your feedback and engaging with you further on what else would you like to know more about? What other interventions are you interested in? Um, so we can see how we can build that in going forward. Thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon. Thanks, Thank Abigail. You. And I. Sorry, thanks, Abigail. And yeah, just once again, thank you to, to all the colleagues that, that's joined us throughout the session. And I think with that, we can uh, officially uh, wrap up today's training session. And uh, yeah, wish you all a lovely day. Thanks, colleagues. Bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate. Bye.